All right, all right, all right. We are live. Welcome in, everyone. I see we've got a couple people in here. We got Psy Deathful. We got Trans Girl Jade. We got Zoe. First time to stream. Welcome in. And we've got uh, not late, just a little not uh, not early Valhalla video. So uh, everyone, welcome into stream. Uh, how are y'all doing? Blub blub indeed. Uh, I am underwater right now, so you know I do have the bubbles. Um, so, if you'll notice up in the top uh, right corner, I have a, a new dono goal, new chair, frowny face. Um, I just had one of the legs of my chair snap a couple days ago, and uh, that thing was already like a replacement for my old um, uh, uh desk chair anyway like i just got it off of a uh, facebook buy nothing group just as that was supposed to be a temporary thing and i've been sitting on that for like a couple years um so right now i'm sitting on a dining room chair and i definitely need to get this replaced uh fortunately i've got like some uh, i have like a uh a bit of an old uh mattress uh, uh memory foam pad i cut a square out of the, an old one that i wasn't using anymore and i'm using that as a seat cushion so it's not too bad, but I don't have, you know, the proper, like, swivel and everything like that. Also, this seat is a little high for my desk, so I would indeed appreciate money. And hey, Sai, thank you. There you go. $20. You are incredibly generous. That will help to get me a new chair. Now, ideally, I would love to get, like, a Herman Miller type C, but those things are, like, $2,000. And, like, like they recently changed the the type C um like in the last couple of years to have a higher weight capacity cuz I'm a big guy and um so if I were to find a type C that was used there's no guarantee that it actually is rated for my weight so if I were to go Herman Miller I would have to spend like $2000 I'd have to pay twice what I paid for my PC but there is a Serta chair that um was actually my previous chair then I paid like 400 for that back in the day, and that lasted probably almost a decade before it broke. So I think I'm probably just going to go for one of those. And then at some point in the future, when I'm got, you know, better financially situated, I can go for the uh, I can splurge for the uh, Herman Miller. But right now I just need something that is a proper streaming chair. It's not going to break the bank but it'll get me where I'm going. So, Sai, thank you for uh, very much again for that $20. If anybody else wants to donate, there is a link down below uh, in the description. And hey, Tipster with the... Oh, no, that's not Tipster. That was Zoe. I had just read Tip, and I thought it was Tipster. Zoe, uh, thank you for the uh, $10, blah, blah. So, anyway, uh, we've got some uh, we got some video games to play today, but before we do that, I do want to get one segment out. Because I've already done two videos on the Drew Barrymore situation, and now that there's a new update, actually, the situation changed before I even got my second video out on my channel, so figured I would get this one out there before we do the video games themselves. So give me a second here. Um, get this set up. Start recording. Okay, so if you've been watching my channel, keeping up with everything, you'll know that uh, I've been keeping an eye on some of the people who are crossing picket lines and scabbing during the uh, big Hollywood strike. And a very significant one the last uh, week or so has been Drew Barrymore, which surprised pretty much everyone. Uh, she generally has the um, air about her of somebody who genuinely cares about other people. And, you know, she's a Hollywood heiress. She's like a fourth generation Barrymore. She was born into wealth. So how much of that is a front? How much? I, it, it, you know, who, who knows? But she was going to cross the picket line and start up her show again. And Trans Girl Jade, thank you for the $25. You are incredibly generous. That will help me out greatly. Back to this. So she, uh, after about a week or so of, you know, um, being very tearful about how she was going to continue scabbing, she finally decided 
that she is postponing the show. However, because all that happened before I got my other video out, I did want to go over the Instagram video that she put out because um, <laughs> I watched a little bit of it and it was uh, pretty wild. Give me a second here. Turn off the background music so I've just got Drew in frame. And if uh, audio is uh, having problems on your end, let me know. But here we go. Let's see what Drew had to say in her four minute Instagram video the other day. I believe there's nothing I can do or say in this moment to make it okay. I wanted to own a decision so that it wasn't a PR protected situation and I would just take full responsibility for my actions. I know there's just nothing I can do that will make this okay for those it is not okay with. I, I mean, there is one thing and she did do it. Although, as we'll get into, um, some people are, are not uh, looking to forgive. And I do kind of want to talk about that, but let's let's let her continue. And when she says, you know, this isn't a PR thing, I mean, it is public relations. She is putting it out. But like, I do believe her that she's not, you know, putting this in the hands of a PR firm because they certainly wouldn't tell her to do a uh, a laptop uh, a webcam without makeup uh, apology in her bedroom that <laughs> they certainly wouldn't do that. Be like, uh, uh, mm -mm. Uh, you, you can't do that kind of apology. Colleen Ballinger ruined it for everyone. I fully accept that. I fully understand that. There are so many reasons why this is so complex. And I just want everyone to know my intentions have never been in a place to upset or hurt anyone. It's not who I am. I mean, I believe that, uh, but that doesn't matter because you did it. <laughs> I've been through so many ups and downs in my life, and this is one of them. I deeply apologize to writers. I deeply apologize to unions. I deeply apologize. Okay. Um, remember, when this video came out, she was still insisting that she was going to be continuing the show. So she was apologizing to the writers and the unions while still doing the thing that they're mad at her for. So that's, that's a worthless apology. That just shows that you feel bad about it. That, that That's not what an apology is. An apology isn't when you feel bad. An apology is acknowledging your harm and uh, making restitution. I don't exactly know what to say because sometimes <clears throat> when things are so tough, it's hard to make decisions from that place. So all I can say is that I wanted to accept responsibility. Well, we and accept no, your I don't responsibility. Have a PR machine behind this. That's obvious. My decision to go back to the show, I didn't want to hide behind people. So I won't. And I won't polish this with bells and whistles and publicists and corporate rhetoric. I'll just stand out there and accept and be responsible. <sighs> There's a huge question of the why. Why am I doing this? <laughs> well, um, I certainly couldn't have expected this kind of attention. Uh yes, you could have. You, you were crossing the picket line. Yes, you could have. Come on. Your, your family has been in, in, in the industry for over a hundred years. Y you know what scabbing is. Um, and um, we aren't 
gonna break rules and we will be in compliance. I wanted to do this because as I- It's not possible to do the kind of show that she does and uh, be in compliance because a talk show like that has segments by its nature and segments have to be written. And so even if it's just Drew doing those segments on her own off the cuff, that still counts as writing. That's her doing the writing. Said this is bigger than me and there are other people's jobs on the line. Okay, this is the rhetoric that we're starting to see. Um, and if you'll remember, uh, several months back, there was leaked uh, information that one of the Hollywood execs said that they wanted to wait until October to uh, come to the table with the WGA because they were like, at that point, the writers will start losing their houses and they'll be, and so uh, the AMPTP will be in a better position to negotiate. And uh, it's not just that, it's also that, you know, they're, they're going to be pointing out the other people who aren't in the WGA, but are working like IATSE or, or one of those other places. And they're going to say, see, they've been out of work too. They're hurting too. But they're hurting because the AMPTP is letting this play out. They're, they're hurting because the AMPTP has let it drag out for months on end because they don't want to pay their workers for what they're doing and they want to replace their workers with AI. There's all sorts of things and it won't just stop with the writers and the actors. IATSE also has concerns in the industry. <laughs> it's not just them. And so when, when you see people point out, it's like, oh, well, you know, uh, the, the, the crew, they, they have jobs too, and they, they need to pay mortgages too. Yeah. Yeah, they do. That's, that's a very important thing. But if you go back to work now without the other members of the production joining in, you're undermining their efforts and you're undermining your own future efforts. And since launching live in a pandemic, I just wanted to make a show that was there for people in sensitive times. And I weighed the scales and I thought if we could go on during a global pandemic and everything that the world has experienced through 2020, why I, I will take this opportunity to point out that the pandemic is still going on. Uh, despite what uh, everyone wants you to think, um, but but she, what the way she's using it, she's citing the pandemic as uh, inspiration for when she started the show. But that has nothing to do with now, because most people have just pretended that the pandemic isn't going on, so it it doesn't have the same like uh, emotional weight now as it did then. The people who are shut in are the uh, are are people who still actually care about COVID exposure. Um, this is just this is just a sympathy ploy. This is just I wanted to do something nice for the people. You're 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 making money for it. Your crew's making money for it. This is a job. Why would this sideline us? So I want to just put one foot in front of the other and make a show that's there for people, regardless of anything else that's happening in the world, because. That's when I think we all need something that wants to be there, being very realistic in very realistic times. So that is my why. That's not actually her why. Her why is the that she wanted to make sure her crew was paid which as i brought up yeah it, it is a big concern for people who aren't striking but are still affected by the strikes still impacting their paychecks and stuff like that uh however drew barrymore is worth 125 million dollars now these celebrity net worth sites obviously 
this isn't an exact figure. They can get things pretty wildly wrong sometimes. But Drew Barrymore is a fourth generation Barrymore. Her family has basically been there since the inception of the film industry. Okay. She is part of a dynasty and she could have paid out of pocket for every single crew member without going back to work. And she could have done all of that. She probably wouldn't even see. Okay. She might have to sell some shares of something or whatever, but she, you know, she is super rich. So if she actually cared about the crew, making sure that they were taken care of, she could dip into her own reserves and pay for them. And it's not like it's unheard of. We were seeing, I think the rock donated over a million dollars to a, uh, to a strike fund. Um, I, I think Greg Berlanti uh, the uh, the guy who was uh, show running a lot of the um, the CW uh, DC shows, I think he just did like over a million dollars uh, to uh, to strike funds. Uh, so so there's things like that that she could have done that would made sure that her crew were paid during the strike without crossing a picket line. Fortunately. After uh, all of the internet pressure, Drew Barrymore and the talk pausing talk show returns amid strike pushback. The actress announced last weekend the Drew Barrymore show would be returning without writers amid the strike, but she has announced she's pausing her self-titled talk show amid the writer strike. Uh, I have listened to everyone and I am making the decision to pause the show's premiere until the strike is over, Barrymore wrote in a statement on Instagram Sunday. I have no words to express my deepest apologies to anyone I have hurt and, of course, to our incredible team who works on the show and has made it what it is today. She concluded, we really tried to find our way forward and I truly hope for a resolution for the entire industry very soon. I think these words are generally sincere. Actually, let me see if I can pull this up on Instagram. Yeah, okay, that was just everything there. So, it worked. She's not doing the show anymore. And, uh, yeah, like this one said, uh, actually, I think this headline changed since last I opened it, because it just said Drew Barrymore was uh, pausing her show return. I've got the talk, postpones return on CBS following Drew Barrymore. And, like another domino, the Jennifer Hudson show pushes back return amid writer's strike. So, we're seeing the knock-on effects of the public pressure that Drew Barrymore was facing for crossing the picket line. And, as this wonderful tweet said, don't stop bullying people online. This strategy is working. Uh, we even have... Um, I saw this thread uh, by David Slack, who is a TV writer, uh, who he's going after uh, Dancing with the Stars. He's tagging a bunch of people who are involved with the next season of Dancing with the Stars. Uh, because even though that is a reality show, it's still WGA covered, and uh, you've got a lot of stars involved, including the uh, not racist Matt Walsh. <laughs> um, but yeah, public pressure is on to, uh, uh, to to stop more shows from from being produced during this, and we're going to see a lot of um, a lot of reality TV being produced, and um, a lot of that is going to use scab labor uh, for, for writing uh, or just, you know, go, go non-union for the writing. Um, but it's good to see that the pressure campaigns are working and it's good to see that Drew Barrymore backed off. Now, let's go to some of the discourse about how to celebrate Drew Barrymore backing off. Um, also, uh, welcome in Geek Filter and Admiral Paco. Nice to see you in chat. Okay, so I saw this tweet. People responding to Drew Barrymore making the right decision with she didn't do it until she got blowback are what's wrong with our country. You make a wrong call, you listen, and you correct. That's not the thing to punish. Fuck you, do the right thing. Okay, I'll do the right thing. Oh, here we go, trying to walk it back now. Don't even think about it, lady social media. There is a nugget of truth here. Um... And I've got my opinion on it, but I kind of want to get uh, get some of the back and forth. And I'm also curious what uh, what chat has to say about it, because it is a good thing that Drew Barrymore stopped. It is good that after all the public pressure, she stopped her show. But 
Let's see what we've got here. Uh, Trekkie Bill, he is a decently sized um, Star Trek uh, um, account on Twitter. I follow him. Uh, he goes, fucking brain dead take. You don't forgive a fucking scab because they suddenly face blowback for being a piece of shit. Uh, so what's the reward for eventually doing the right thing? Nothing. You should have done the right thing in the first place. Okay, uh, fuck that attitude. Uh, 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 first off, uh, like in general, in, in terms of scabbing, we're, we're, I'll, I'll get into it. But like this as a general attitude, you should have done the right thing in the first place. And we shouldn't reward people for changing their mind and doing the right thing. That's a bad attitude to have. That's shitty. I can't sign off on this. Um, and then I had this one tweet. They locked their account, um, and I couldn't find like a uh, screenshot of it. But it was cached in my um, yeah, in, in my uh, uh, bookmarks. So this tweet said, "Gotta hand it to Drew Barrymore. Not only did she decide to do the right thing." She also made herself an example of how to publicly change your mind and your actions when you've learned better. It's never too late to make a better choice. And, uh, yeah, um, Luke Barnett, who was the one who said this one, goes, it's almost as if Drew Barrymore listening to criticism and doing the right thing is having positive results. It's almost as if we should create a society that encourages people to listen and change. It's almost as if we should be a society that forgives. Um, we've got more praise for Drew Barrymore. Honestly, recognizing you're wrong, apologizing and reversing course publicly is tough, and Drew Barrymore deserves praise for getting there. If Studio Chiefs had her strength of character, the strike would be over. Also, I interviewed Drew Barrymore when The Wedding Singer came out, and she was so nice, and it was a lovely experience for me. I'm glad I can go back to being a fan. That. That we gotta talk about. Uh, yeah, it's great that Drew Barrymore stopped. It's great that the show's not going on. Um, that, that, that is a win for the WGA. Um, Drew Barrymore scabbed. And it's not just a, a, a case of, oh, well, you did the wrong thing, um, but you acknowledged it and apologized. So, uh, n you know, now we can go back to pretending like you, you didn't undermine uh, people dur during a strike. Um, I don't think people should be going out of their way to uh continue harping on drew barrymore like i'm putting this video out unless she does something else like i'm pretty much uh saying all i have to say about it but she scabbed she harmed the strike movement when she didn't have to she is in a financial situation where she could have just paid for everyone herself out of pocket and it would have been fine and she harmed the you know uh the, she harmed uh, uh, workers in Hollywood by doing this. Uh, I, technically, I, I think she's uh, her show set in New York, but I, I use Hollywood as, you know, the general, uh, you know, WJ East and West are both on strike. I think our energy should be focused on targeting people who are currently scabbing. So, uh, like, this tweet says, so we focus our ire on Ma on Mar, who will revel in it as he welcomes the only guest willing to cross a picket line, making his final descent into the alt-right cesspool. Yeah, Bill Maher, currently scabbing. Uh, I don't imagine he will stop. Um, but I don't think that Drew Barrymore should be allowed a future in Hollywood after this. Um, I think people should think twice before accepting a booking on her show. Um, scabbing hurts everyone and you can't let scabs back in so I, I, I'm not gonna like harp on Drew Barrymore I'm not gonna make this like a, a uh, an anti Drew Barrymore channel or anything like that Um, I'm just gonna move on from it I can't you know I, I don't <laughs> I, I'm nobody in, in this vast uh, uh, internet landscape so my opinion weigh that for what it is um i don't think that uh people in hollywood should be uh working with drew ever again after this um i don't think anybody should be working with scabs in hollywood ever and e even if they change their mind and do the right thing and there there is something to be said for rewarding people for changing their mind and doing the right thing 
But scabbing isn't just having a bad opinion. Scabbing is doing actual material harm to the labor movement. And so you... Uh, it, when when you're dealing with with this kind of a business, when you're dealing with these unions, I don't think you can let it go. Um, Drew Barrymore is richer than God. She'll be fine, whether she gets work again ever ever or not. I mean, she was born with a silver spoon in her mouth. She's fine. I don't think people should be working with her. Um, I don't think people should be expending a lot of energy on it. I think in the future, if people do work with her, maybe side eye them. Um, I certainly think that SAG AFTRA should probably uh, look at kicking her out, even though she didn't do anything to violate SAG, SAG AFTRA rules. Um, she she definitely crossed the WGA, and I think uh, worker solidarity is very important. And I think SAG AFTRA should definitely weigh that and whether they allow her to continue to be a member. But in terms of people who are happy that she's done the right thing and are celebrating her, I, I don't care to like browbeat them over that. I, you know, I get it. I, I understand people having uh, an emotional connection, uh, like a, a parasocial connection to certain actors. Um, I get that people have um, people have watched Drew Barrymore's show and quite like it. Um, I've seen positive things from it. I've never watched it myself, but it's my understanding. Like uh, when Dylan Mulvaney was on there, that was pretty nice. Uh, she's uh, Drew Barrymore has has done some good work. Didn't she direct a pretty lesbian movie? Like um, it was a roller der derby movie, right? Um, which I just associate with lesbians, <laughs> but. So, like, I get it. I, I get that there are complicated emotions involved, and I get people want their faves to be doing the right thing, and they want to go ahead and forgive them once they've done the wrong thing, and then apologized for it. And interpersonally, I'm not looking to browbeat any of that. That's fine. I don't care. But I don't think she should work in the industry again. I, I think she should be done after this. And so I would recommend that uh, any celebrity guests who might be lined up for the Drew Barrymore show in the future, once the once the strikes are over, reconsider that booking. You know, talk to someone else. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I would say that's about it. Uh, thank you, Drew, for um, reversing course, but you still did it, and I think you're going to have to live with that for the rest of your life. Go team. All right, give me a second here. And got my background music back on. I forgot to turn it off. Ah, yeah, thanks for that. Thank you, Valhalla. I, I thought I did pretty well there, too. Now, let me get my Blidio Blames up and running. Don't panic that there is a blank screen. It will be remedied shortly. Hang on, where's the... Oh yeah, let's switch you over. There. Bring you down. Good enough. All right. You have Haribo for dinner because you ran out of food. Hey, look, we've all been there. Oh, hey, where's my uh, on DOS box? Do you show? There we go. Okay, let's play some Commander Keen. Does anybody remember this game? Platformer from the early 90s? I've got it all set up so that I can uh, play it on my uh, Xbox controller. So 
Let's do this. Oh yeah, and the plot is you're an eight-year-old who built a spaceship uh, and crashed on Mars. And uh, you built it out of like household appliances from your uh, 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 fr from your uh, parents' house. <laughs> so I have to collect. Actually, let me see. Yeah. So there is a joystick, a car battery, a vacuum cleaner, and some hooch. And I need to collect all of that to fix my rocket and return to Earth. Now these little green guys, I think they're called. Yarps? Oh god, I used to remember what they're called, but they uh, they don't hurt, but they do push you around, and which can put you in a sticky situation. There's two ways to deal with them. The humane one is just to step on them, which just stuns them for a little bit. And then there is the less humane solution. If you guys will stop. <laughs> I do feel bad about that. Those guys, they're just trying to, you know, be little friends. They're just happy. And I just murdered two of them in cold blood. All right. You hear in your mind, it is too bad that you cannot read the standard galactic alphabet, human. And I didn't have enter as uh, one of my <laughs> things on my controller. So you'll you'll see this flashing sign here. Um, you can kind of read it as exit, like it it, it is in the the alien language. But um, I think in the third uh, game they have uh, like you you visit a, an alien planet where they've got the whole like thing uh, laid out uh, at, in like a school, so that you've got the whole substitution cipher. So you can translate some of the little hidden messages in the game, but, uh... Here we go. I now have the pogo stick. And I need the pogo stick to get up these invisible platforms. Dodge the fire. Oh dear, I almost fell in the fire. And that guy is called a Garg. And when he sees you, he charges at you. But uh, I'm just going to leave him be, because there is limited ammo in the game. I'd rather save it for something uh, important. Now, come on, guys. Go fall in the spiky pit. That's right. Now you can't push me in the spiky pit. Oh, hang on. Oops. I make it up here. Those teddy bears are worth a lot. You can only get lives by uh, getting enough points. Yeah, I don't think I can reach the teddy bear. Okay, well. Those lollipops are worth a few, couple points. Key card. And that guy also can't hurt you, but he can push you, so... Oops. That's not what I meant to do. Would you stop that? Whoa, whoa! He killed me. He pushed me into it. I should've... I should've fired. So how's everyone doing today? Eh.
SD card. Okay, now that guy can't push me into the clam. A gun. I've got nine shots. So I want to make everyone count. Guy, stop pushing me around. Dying from period cramps. I'm sorry to hear that. I hear that a giant tub of ice cream is a good um, cure for that. This guy, with the hops, that's a Vorticon. And he takes several shots to kill, so I try to just avoid him. But uh, the Vorticons are kind of the main antagonist here. They're the little humanoid dog guys. So, um, I don't know if I'm going to keep playing Death Stranding on stream. Um, I wasn't really having a lot of fun with it. And if I'm not having fun playing a game on stream, I don't know how uh, entertaining that's going to be for others, you know? I kind of want to be... If I'm not having a good time, I'm not going to have a lot of fun things to say, you know? There's a Vorticon there. I might have to shoot through him. I, ooh, he's getting close. Okay, I want you to jump. There we go. Ah. I tried to fire, but uh, that didn't work. Let's do this again. Now, my question is, I do keep ch the guns that I collect even after I die. Okay. Well, that's good to know, because there's a bunch of guns to get in here. By the way, I've got 10 viewers, but only 8 likes. So if you haven't liked the stream yet, don't forget to go ahead and do that. That helps me out a lot. It uh, pushes the stream to uh, more people, the more likes it gets. So uh, help me out, and that'll help you out, too. More people will be in chat for you to talk to. So... After I do, I, I think I'm going to do the three Commander Keen, uh, there's actually, I think, six Commander Keen games, but I'm going to do the first three. And after I do that, um, I've got, I, was, I think, oh, come on, get me up there. I think I was going to play Star Control 3. Um, most people don't really, they're not really familiar with Star Control 3. If they've played one, they've played Star Control 2, which is generally considered to be the better game. Uh, I played Star Control 3 a lot when I was a kid. Where did the Vorticon go? Did he fall off? I think he walked off the, the, there's, um, this whole area. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but yeah, I, I think the Vorticon just, like, fell off of there. <laughs> Anyway, that was the joysticks, so 
I've got two of the four things I need to fix my ship. You've never heard of Star Control? Um, it's fun. There's uh, there's some really fun alien design, and it's so it's a um, it's a kind of a um, it's an adventure game. There's there's a story to it. Um, I, Star Control Three tried to be a little bit of a 4X because there's like uh, planetary colonization and, and uh, resource management and stuff like that. But you can actually basically ignore most of that in Star Control Three. Um, and just go with, like, the existing planetary bases. So, we'll, uh, we'll see how I do with that. But it is a fully voiced game, and it came out in, like, the mid-90s, so for it to be fully voiced, that's kind of cool. And there's a gun. Now I think there's a garg. Now I think there isn't a garg. Teleporter. exit is somewhere. Is it up here? Yes, here we go. A card. Slide on the, s the ice. And Vorticon. I'm just, it, so narrow that I'm just gonna kill him, but he takes four hits. How many? I got 29 charges. Yeah, we're good. I'm not worried. If we've got 29 shots, I can spare to use a couple extra. Oh yeah, by the way, so the controls here to jump, it's con uh, you press a control button. To get the pogo stick, you press alt. But then to fire, you press both of them at the same time. Now, I mapped it on my controller so that I've got both control and alt as a separate button, but if I press both, it will still it, it will still fire, so not the best uh, controller mapping design, and I know for Keen 4, they change it so that space is used to fire, so it's got its own dedicated button. A book. And that was me getting a new Keen. I let, I got a one-up. Hey, what's up? You will need a ray gun in the end, but not to shoot the Vorticon. The uh, final Vorticon, I think I like hacked the game once to give myself a whole bunch of shots just to see if it was possible to kill the Vorticon with like uh, ray guns, and I think it took like a hundred shots to kill him. So there is uh, instead a platform above him that you shoot to smush him with. Oh, uh, Zoe, um, I actually have a bunch of Blue Sky invites. Um, if you join my Discord, uh, 
with the link is in the description uh and then just uh ping me in there i can hook you up with an invite yeah i've got like at least three i've got three on my main and i haven't checked how many i've got on my alt so yeah if you want in i can easily get you set up oh come on Let's try that again. I don't even need to do this level, but I kind of want to do all the levels, you know? I'm not trying to speedrun this. I watched, I looked up um, this game on speedrun.com, and I think the uh, the world record is something like three and a half minutes. You only do the necessary levels. Let's get some speed. Oh, come on! There's no... There's no coyote time for this? I was trying to jump, and it just... Eh. If I die on this one again, I'm gonna give up on this level. There's nothing actually... necessary to this level. I just want to finish them all. There we go. Okay. Get those books. I just used a couple lives in this level, so I better get those points to get my lives back up. What do you got for me? There is a hidden city. Look in the dark area of the city to the south. I don't even need to kill you. Oh, jeez. I don't like fire. The fire makes me nervous. I got a teddy bear. That's worth a lot of points. You hear in your mind, GARG! Because that's what those guys are called. Oop, let's get this one first. What do we got up here? Oh, this is just a juicer. Killing those guys now. And you. Come on, guys. Let's get you down here. Apparently, they are immune to fire. A Yorpish whisper says, Look for dark hidden bricks. You can see knots, but their upper left corner. Yeah, I already know about that. That's what they're called. They're called Yorps. Okay. Ooh. More guns. 
That's a lot of guns. You can tell that Pepsi did not pay for this product placement because the logo is to the side and not the front. Now this area is a bit of a maze, but there's a key. Oh jeez. Oh, shit. <laughs> Just missed him. Leave that guy there. I'm gonna let that guy come down if he comes down. I don't trust that. There we go. Okay, got the blue key card. Let's head on down this way. All these soda cans reminds me I'm out of soda. But my EBT just refilled, so I should be able to get some more. New key card. Okay, so I need... I can see up top there's four doors. I've got two of the keys. One of the keys is right over there. So I just gotta figure out how to get up there. Now... Pretty sure I need to go down here. Oh, what is that? That was some bullshit. Now I gotta do all this again. Let's go down this way first. Aha. Uh -huh. So that's the way to get out of there. So I just need to, when I go down there, dodge the fire. Don't want to go down there. There's nothing for me. Backtrack to get there. I knew I know there's something up there. I don't know if it's a key or if it's just a secret, but I want it. There we go. Is that seriously it? Oh 
Holy shit. That scared me. Come on. Damn it! I was trying to jump and then fire. Oh, I've got 52 charge right now. Uh, and two keens. Okay. So. I think for some of these, I just need to be patient with the gargs instead of trying to rush them. Okay. Those guys are gone now. Let's let you come on down. Okay, I saw there was a little bit of hang time before I jumped there, so there is coyote time in this game. So that one time that I died was just some BS. Let's head this way. Is there a key up here? No key. Nothing up here either. That's a bit of a man's level. That's bullshit. I've only got one life left. And I've got everything except the hooch. I'm just gonna go ahead and beat the level beat the game now, otherwise I'm gonna have to start from the beginning. Hey, welcome in, uh, Rahan Rashid. You love the zappy laser makes when you hit something. It's cute. Yeah, oh yeah, it's a cute game. They 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 packed a lot of character into uh such a uh, simple game. Hey, that's right. This was made by Id. Oh, that was a weird little glitch on the screen. Okay, I think I need to go up this way to get to it. Yeah. I remember as a kid, I thought it was called ID software, not id software. Ooh, pizza! Hey, and I gotta level up. Okay. That means I can afford one death. There's a key card in there that I need to get. I think that's it for all the secrets down there. Okay, this should be fun. Got it. Whew, that was close. Do 
Do I need to not use the poker stick? Just, yeah, okay. Regular jumps. Just Pepsi, oh well. Now how about up here? There we go. Hey, and I got the key card, so. Let's head on up here. Now you can see there is a Vorticon. And there is a big rock above him. Squish. And hey, there's my hooch. Commander Keen returns to the Bean with Bacon Mega Rocket and quickly replaces the missing parts. He must get a home before his parents do. Just a quick trip from Mars to Earth. You know, it's not that far. There we are. There's Earth. Wait, what's that thing over there? Huh? Oh, no! Keen makes it home and rushes to beat his parents upstairs. Honey, let's see if little Billy is asleep. Billy, are you uh what is this one-eyed green thing in your room? Aw oh, mom, can't I keep him? I took a Yorp with me. Well, we'll talk about it in we'll talk about that in the morning, son. You get some rest. I like how they're immediately just very nonchalant about the fact he's got a friggin' alien in his room. Good night, dear. But there is no sleep for Commander Keen. The Vorticon mothership looms above, ready to destroy Earth. Okay, let's go, Keen. Let's get to be continued. All right. Answer your name, Yay Fesh. Let's go. Yep. Okay. Now let me launch the next game. Come on, where are you? At? There we go. And you make sure that the game audio is okay. Episode two, the earth explodes. Let's go. So we are now aboard the mothership. Now, as I recall, the, the, the Vorticons are much easier to kill in this game. Because it's their ship, so there will be more of them on here. But there's a burger. Oh, and those guys I can just stand on. Wow. I just landed right in, like, the one thing in the level that can kill me. <laughs> Yes. 
Where are we going now? And if I recall correctly, I think you can actually stand on those col Yes, you can stand on the colas. So they are uh, both a, um, a collectible as well as a potential platform. I think that's kind of a cool mechanic. What's down here? A Vorticon. How many shots does it take to kill you? Just one. Okay. I think they're color-coded, so yellow is one hit. And I think the others are have, have different colors, and so they take a different number of hits to kill. There's a teddy bear over there, but I'm not going to try for it because it's right next to a little lightning thing. I don't like these blind falls. Okay. Oh, shit. Damn, that guy almost fucking murked me. Alright, let's get out of here. And we've got that key card. So... Oh my god. There we go. I think I need to get to that moving platform. Him. Let's get some more. Oops. Come on. I know I can get that teddy bear. It means more lives. Vorticon over there. Come on, pal. I have a feeling they're here to destroy Earth, so I don't feel too bad about killing them, but I need a green key card. Where's my green key card? more dudes over here. Oh, he... Look at his hops. Okay. Got him. There's my key card. Oh my god, you know what? There we go. Had to use that guy. Bounce off him. Now, 
I don't think I'm gonna go in there. That fire looks not happy for me. So that Vorticon, he can go ahead and enjoy hopping in fire all by himself. So Zoe, um, Oregon can actually be, uh, it's, you, you got into the boonies, yeah, it's very white, but, um, if you're in the Portland area, you'll probably be pretty good. Also, like, Oregon has, um, uh, made healthcare part of, um, it's, uh, uh, like, guaranteed universal healthcare as part of its constitution. And so basically all, like, trans-related healthcare is, like, fully covered by the state. If you make under a certain thre income threshold, you'd basically just get on their uh, state insurance, which covers pretty much everything you would need if you're, if you are trans. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you can only get that gun if you bounce off of the, um, the can. If you collect the cans, you can't get that gun. And if I collect those cans, I let that guy out. So I'm not going to do that. Okay. That's actually kind of cool that those guys are locked in like that. Hamburger. Hamburger gave me a level up. Oh, you know what? I think I need this guy. Yeah. I think I need to climb up him. Yes. There we go. Okay. There's a button here. Oh, it turns out the lights. Probably disable something. Before I do that, let's turn it back on. I'm curious to see if there's something that's in the way. What do we got down here? Oh, jeez. Oh, shit, that guy shoots. Do a jump. Oh, no, he hit me. All right, let's try this one again. Okay. And now let's free this guy. And I think I just want to have the lights off. Oh no! I'll, ha I'll wait for him to fall back down. There we go. And fall back down. Perfect. Now let's get that light. I don't trust that guy. If I recall correctly, yeah, he just stuns you. Okay. Well, he got out, so. And I've got a gun now. I think I just... Oops. Oh no! 
I don't want to do that. <laughs> okay, so don't activate that. Good to know. I'm sorry, everyone. I just uh, I just blew up uh, the planet. I, I hope you weren't too attached to it. Uh, and uh, Valhalla Baby, yeah, I did see the... Uh, well, I, I haven't looked at the exact allegations against Russell Brand. I just, when he came out and said there were going to be allegations coming against him, I just assumed they were all true. Um, <laughs> all right, let's uh, try that one over. And this time I don't need to explore, because I know what I'm looking for. That's right, I need the key card. Not this one. Oh shit. That guy almost got me. I go down this way. Right? Yes. Key card yet. Navarra did a whole stream on it today, if I want to find out. Yeah, um... I imagine Demon Mom is probably going to cover it, right? At some point. I usually just, uh... Watch her coverage of stuff. Oh shit. Key card. Get on out of here. I don't even need to kill the Vorticons. Except for that one guy. Oh, Come on. I did it before. Maybe I just need to go this way. Get a gun at least. Oh, I don't think I can actually get up there, so I do need to go back to that. Or I can get sniped by a Vorticon that I foolishly left alive. Oh, come on! I was trying to jump over him. I don't know, folks. I don't know if I'll be able to save the Earth. These doggos are just, uh... too much for me to handle. Come on this way. Honestly... Humanity kind of deserves to die if uh, if I can't save them because like if Earth was dependent on an eight year old boy for its salvation and it didn't have any other planetary defenses, 
an eight-year-old boy was able to go to space and figure out all this stuff. Oops, wrong buttons. You know, kind of feels like that one's on us. There we go. No, I've got 11 shots. Okay. I should be okay. Earth is doomed to begin with? Yeah. Oh, shit. Wrong button. We talk about how most video games the protagonist is under 25, like I don't depend on a little child literal child to save me. Well, I mean, for like Commander Keen, it kinda makes sense. Like, this was this game is made for kids, right? So it makes sense that an eight-year-old is the protagonist. Come on over. What the fuck, Valhalla? That's insane. Oh, I know what I need to do. I need to get up here, and then... There. I have now disabled that Earth laser. And I got a teddy bear for my efforts. Oh, you little bitch. I'm, I'm killing... Guys, I am going to kill that kid. This is before the ESRB came out, but I, I literally just murdered a child. So, let's uh, see if I can get up. Oh my god, and I missed. I wasted a shot. Okay. Come on, child. Come on back. I will get you. Those children are dead. I have robbed the Vorticons of a future generation. And I'll do it again. Because those guys fucking suck. I don't feel too bad about it, considering how many children the Vorticons are going to be killing when they destroy Earth, you know? Hey, what's up? I just killed your son. Oh, shit. Shit, 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 shit. I tried to fire and just got the pogo stick instead. Okay, there we go. How many shots? I got eight shots. I need some... I need another pistol. Yeah, Valhalla, like... Uh, people were calling it, right? Like, there was, a, there was a tweet from, like, eight months ago that said, yeah, uh, Russell Brand's grift to the right is just because he's trying to get ahead of some rapes. Hey, a gun. Oh, it's this guy. Oh. Okay, he takes three hits. Okay, I have blown up 
that laser. I think those signs, if you translate them, tell you what city they're pointed at. But I didn't get a look at what uh, the graphic of the city was, so I have no idea what it is. People who still follow Russell are saying, yeah, no, he, uh, dude, dude's a cult leader. A gun. Give me. How many guns do I have? I have 13 guns. Oh, shit. I'm coming back up here because there is a teddy bear. And teddy bears are light. Yeah, I got an extra life from that one. There we go. A cake? How many lasers? I got 11 lasers, okay. Let all of you guys come on out so I can climb up that thing. There was another one. Oh, there was three teddy bears. I'm not going back for him. Come on up. I want you to come on up. There we go. Oh, the fucking kids. Come on up. Jump up. Come on. Okay, you've gotten down. You know what? Something tells me I don't need to be here. Although, I don't think I can make that jump. There we go. Let's just get out of here. Now you... Probably a laser. Gun. If he's here, then I must be right by. Yep. Wow. That was a lot of dudes. Good to know. Don't go down there. In fact, I probably, if I can, I want to go up. Up, right? Well, there's a guy up there, so I need to figure out how to get up there. Uh -oh. Ooh. I can get up here from here. I don't think I actually want to go up there. Hang on. No, I need to go down below. Because I do need to get to that room to blow up the laser. 
This is a tough one. Keens left. Let's go. This is a tough fucking level, and we'll save that much. Okay, 20 shots. Get this guy to come back around, and then I want to jump up. I want to jump on him and, and pogo stick off the top of him to get up there. Damn it. Okay. I think... Once he gets over here, I'll land on him. Yeah. There we go. Okay. That's how we do it. I have saved another city. Your children have lost their bone broth for today? Why is that? I just saved New York. Let's go to- I, I was thinking that was probably New York. It's always good to save New York. What do we got up here? A key card and a gun. Now I need to find the other key card, which I imagine is this way. Yes. Okay, I need to let this guy drop down and ride him up. Oh my god, look at all. Oh, how do I get up there? I think I need to let this guy circle back around. And then when he comes back around, I can grab him and jump off of him to get all those guns. Because look at all those guns. No! How many guns do I got? 22? Eh. I'm just gonna... That would be really nice. Oh shit. Oh shit. Okay, that guy's dead. Okay. Blown up another laser. I really should stop and like look at see what those cities are because I just wasn't even paying attention.
Okay, those look like one-way gates. And I can't get back up there, so I can't get that gun. Holy shit. I died. But, now that I know that those were one-way gates, I can go back and get those guns. And I got a 1-up. to get up there, I need to ride. There we go. Oh my god. You know what? That is not worth it. Alright, let's let the platform come back to me. Oh shit. I tried to shoot that guy so that he wouldn't push me off. Nope, none of those shots hit. I wasted a bunch. Shit. And then I died. But good to know that this is another laser to disable. I can't believe it. That 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 was just on me. And I just wasted a shot for no reason. But I got 24, so I should be okay. Took care of him now. Oh, my God! I was mid bounce and he hit me. I got one keen left. If I die here. That's it. The Earth dies. Oh, I got a life. got me. Damn, that guy's good. Alright. Last life again. That one misses him. Okay, we're good. Now, I got 23 shots. 
Okay, he's dead now. Come on down. You're also dead. This is Paris. Oh. All right. Paris has been saved. I hope you're happy, Paris. I died a whole bunch for you. How many lives do I got? Just the one. Key card. Another key card. Oh shit. Come on. Holy shit. Damn it. Oh, okay. I thought I was just dead. Okay, got a one up. So as long as I see a keen there, I'm not on my last life. Gotcha. I like the key card noise. Do -do 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 -do. Another key card. I've got all four key cards now. now I need to get out of this maze. How do I get out of here? I wasn't supposed to backtrack. I was supposed to keep... The way out is through the maze. Okay. Good to know. Hey, here we are. Oh, jeez. Okay, so that pit does actually lead somewhere, but I wasn't going to risk it. I think we've got every- yep, okay, so... What do you have left? Okay, I need... In order to get that one... I need to find one of those red guys. First key card. Oh, jeez. Last life. OK. 
Okay, so I do need all of the keys. Come up. Okay, so nothing over here. He was about to shoot me, too. Got a one up. And some extra guns. Mm. Oh, these fucking kids. them out because I know I need to ride one of these guys oh wow he just goes like right through come on back I'm just gonna have to like follow him through everything so that he eventually gets me where I need to go. Unless he just goes in there and dies. We'll see what happens. I think he might just die. Unless... Here, let me... Who knows? I need him to come up from the other side if he comes up at all. Nope. All right, well, time to find another solution to this problem. I just got a bunch of guns, killed a bunch of dudes, but without that final key card, it's for naught. I wonder, is there a hidden platform somewhere? Is it a case where, like, I need to, um... only get rid of a certain number of, uh, things? Yeah, because... I've got all the other keys, I just don't have that one, and I think I might have screwed myself. Wait, you're back. That means you looped. Do I just need to go back and wait for you? Yep, I'm going over here. Go in here and waiting for something to respawn. Come 
Come on, how do I... I think I need to die and restart this one. How many lives? I got one life, okay. Yeah, I think I screwed myself out of the victory here, but I got another life. And actually, I'm not even going to try for that one yet. Ho ho ho, look at all those guns. Oh shit, shit, shit. I think that's it. Yeah, I died. I saved five cities. Well, I mean, did I save those five cities, though? Because the Earth did just blow up. I might have saved those cities from the laser specifically pointing at them, but when every single laser can just blow up the planet, I... Yeah, I don't think I actually saved that. <laughs> okay. Let's start over. Let's see. See how well we do this time around. Bullshit. You know, I think I am probably at, uh, I think I'm just hitting a, a brick wall with Commander Keen, so I am actually going to open up a different game. Give me a second here. Uh, where's the thing? Okay, and game audio can... There we go. Now I just need to... Make this bigger. Yeah, we are doing a new game. This is Star Control 3. And this one has, a. Uh, Full voice acting, so I don't even need to read the things. Although I will be reading my responses, but uh, let's go. This was copyright 1996. Okay. Have a good night, Valhalla Nvidia. At the end of the hierarchy war, you sacrificed your priceless precursor vessel to demolish the enemy battle platform, the Sumatra. You escaped in a tiny pod ship, hoping to outrun the cataclysmic energies unleashed in the final explosion. Oh yeah, love that 90s CGI. But the massive energies unleashed in the cataclysmic maelstrom ripped a hole in time and pulled your escape pod into the near future. You witnessed a great battle at the galactic core a vast armada of the galaxy's great sentient races stood poised against an unknown enemy as reality itself hovered on the brink of interdimensional collapse. Oh no. You lost consciousness as you watched the sentient races die, screaming, their life energies sucked into the void. Why wasn't I sucked into the void? Your escape pod then hurtled back through time and space to your home quadrant. Oh, well, that's convenient. Back home, your allies celebrated your victory as reality continued to deteriorate. Suddenly, hyperspace travel stopped working. The only form of interstellar travel travel left was your newly built precursor vessel. 
You hastily formed a union between your old allies and the defeated hierarchy. Explorer groups warped toward the galactic core in search of a cure for a dying galaxy. All right, let me pause real quick. And so here is the star map. Uh, you can see the green area means an area that I've got enough fuel to go to and return from. Right now, there are no stars that I can go to and return from. Uh, red means it's a one way trip. And because this is actually here, let me turn that off. This is actually a 3D map. So, well, whoa, whoa, that goes way too fast. But uh, I can actually, yeah, here. Yeah, that's insanely fast. But, but let me just set the map right over here. And now we've got the um, the system map. So we can take a look at each of the planets. It tells me if it's got any resources. This has a bunch of resources. Um, it's also got a colony on it. And then over here, this has an anomaly. And down here, you can see, take a look at some ships. There's a bunch of spaceships there. There's a spaceship there, and this is me in my precursor vessel. So why don't I go ahead and take a look at this anomaly and move up speed. Back, 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 five, five, seven, six squared. Back, 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 eight, 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 warning. Utilization to the 356 power divided by warning. Back, 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 warning. Oh dear, I realize I am blocking all of the important dialogue. Which means, give me one second here. Oh man. Hang on. I want to, um... Here, let's try this again. I was trying to make a, uh duplicate I wanted to make sure it saved my uh, position so I'm just creating a new version of me that goes up here how's that and then I can move down here as needed but we'll be up here for now okay so we're humans from earth of the League of Sentient Races. We come in peace. How may we classify you, fellow sentients? Or I could say, I can't understand you. Or could you at least make an effort to sound intelligible? Or you're not sentient, are you? Let's go with the standard We're Humans from Earth greeting of the League of Sentient Races. We come in peace. How may we classify you, fellow sentients? Back, 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 back. 5299 I don't think our translator's working. I can't understand you, or are you just an automated drone? If you're actually sentient, say something that makes at least a little bit of sense. Inversion, 982 Tor, back, 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 back. Okay, I think it's attacking me. So, let us select my ship. Pew, 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 pew. I'm also changing that to an overhead view because it's easier to see. Okay, now that I've destroyed that guy, let's take a look. We've got an anomaly here. I've got some humans. I can send them down to pick the thing up. Got it. Now let's go talk over here. Hiya, Captain. Boy, are we glad to see you. Any problems getting here? Nope, piece of cake. We were starting to get a little worried. After all, we're stuck here on an unfamiliar planet, in an unknown quadrant, and can't even fly out of this system without you. You are our last, best, and only hope of survival. And not just our survival, but also the survival of all the star-fearing races, especially now that hyperspace travel no longer works, and your precursor vessel is the only ship capable of interstellar flight. But don't let that pressure you. We have faith in your leadership. I won't let it bother me at all. The first thing we need to do is find the other League races. They've been scattered all over the nearby systems by your precursor vessel's warp bubble transport. Um, first I have some questions. How can we help? Tell me about the Earthling Cruiser. The Earthling Cruiser was built primarily for exploration and not as a pitiless weapon of war. 
but we hold up pretty well in combat. We're not the fastest, but we are maneuverable. We have a short-range point defense laser, but that's best for incoming attackers. The main weapon is a long-range homing missile. The best tactic is to keep the enemy at bay and pound them with nukes from a distance. Tell me about our mission. Our main mission is to restore the structural integrity of the space-time continuum and restore galactic hyperspace travel. When hyperspace travel stopped working throughout the galaxy, we were afraid that sentient beings would be forever cut off from one another, doomed to never fly to another star. Ironically, the catastrophe happened not long after you beat the Urquan by destroying their ability to make war. When you destroyed their horrific precursor battleship, the Sumatra, we were safe in the galaxy. But even if you hadn't, the Urquan would have been crippled in space. Go on. Before the loss of hyperspace, you had returned to the precursor planet Unzervolt, where you were born. You were lucky to have been born there. Earth was suffering under the tender mercies of the Urquan at the time. Your parents didn't know it at the time, but being part of a crew that crash landed on Unzervolt was the best thing they could have done for you. You grew up among abundant precursor artifacts and developed an affinity for advanced technology. You build a precursor ship, and the rest is history. You kicked Urquan butt all over the quadrant. Because you sacrificed your precursor vessel to stop the Sumatra, you returned to Unzervolt to try to build a second one. You were stranded there when hyperspace travel collapsed. You were stranded on the primitive world of Unzervolt for a second time. I like how this guy uh, knows my life story, but has to tell it to me. But, you know, yes, but this time I had real food supplies and didn't have to subsist on Ortog milk and Libix meat. All the allied races were sure they were stranded forever. We cursed our unworking ships that could not take us beyond our solar systems. And then you showed up. You had not only been able to build a new precursor vessel, but you found a way to circumvent the collapse of hyperspace. Your new vessel did not rely on hyperspace, but used a hot new precursor technology you discovered, the warp bubble transport. Most people had never even seen a precursor vessel. You had piloted two. Jealous? I'd be lying if I said no. Anyway, you rallied the allied races to work together to seek the cause of the destruction. You even enlisted the repentant members of the defeated Urquan hierarchy into your newly minted League of Sentient Races. You described a strange experience you had after you destroyed the Sumatra, in which you traveled through a rift in time and glimpsed the future destruction of all sentient life. Candidly, many sentients thought that your vision was the product of delusions. After all, you were comatose when we finally picked up your escape pod. But you had the only means of interstellar transport, and the sentient races would have accepted a lot more eccentricity to get some mobility again. Well, thanks for the vote of confidence. Sure thing. Anyway, you explained to all the races that the only way to repair the damage to the space-time continuum and stop the loss of sentient life is to uncover the secrets of the precursors. Since the mysterious rainbow worlds point forward, and since many precursor artifacts seem to lie in that direction, we came to the galactic core. Your precursor vessel's warp bubble transport carried ships from each league race and scattered them to different systems in this region of the Kasari Quadrant. Now, all you have to do is find each race and establish contact with them. Go on. We need to pick up stocks of cryogenically suspended colonists from each league race and establish their colonies on Kasari planets. The colonists are in suspended animation, ready to be thought out as we gain the resources to properly put them to work colonizing and searching for precursor lore. All of us pledge to be loyal to the League and to give our lives if necessary in order to restore the integrity of the fabric of space. So the, um, uh, yeah, the, the colonization aspect of this game is actually kind of lackluster and you actually don't really need to do it. Um, in order to bait the game. You can just go based on uh, the aliens' home worlds alone for, like, fuel and everything. But there is a story beat that only unlocks if I build an Urquan colony, so I'm going to do that, but I'm not going to... I'm probably not going to be building uh, any other colonies. I've got what I need. Keep up the good work, everyone. Talk to you soon, Captain. But let me pick up those guys. And... Let's give you some more workers. Let's bump all of this up. Oops. Icom online.
Uh, yes, hi, what is it? Sir, this display represents your primary interface with the shipwide interconferencing and monitoring system, also popularly known as ICOM. This system is available oh to several autonomous ship functions for the recording, reporting, and transmission of important league strategic and tactical information. ICOM also represents the central repository for league intelligence materials and can be called on to assist you in the planning and execution of league operations. I just realized that I'm up here. I am blocking when ICOM says stuff, but uh, fortunately it's voiced. Uh, say, great, thanks for the information. ICOM offline. All right. Actually, I'm not going to have the landing pad up, but let's get these guys up. Now let's see my range. Okay. Now there should be an event happening at the end of day two. I'm gonna wait for that. Let's move up. There we go. Dak -dak -lack -pack. It's the Dak Tack Lack Pack again. Dak -dak -lack -pack. Utilization to the 356th power divided by warning. Dak -dak -lack -pack. Warning. Okay, well that greeting didn't work. Let's say I can't understand you. Dak -dak -lack -pack. 5299 and 58X. Are you just an automated drone? Inversion 982 Guess we're doing this again. Come at me, bro. Okay. Um, let's talk to ICOM. What do we got? ICOM online. Uh, you certainly know HAL 9000 is literally a, a, a option uh, of dialogue. Yeah, he does look like HAL. A signal received from an emitter on Goshen 4 confirms the presence of a Spathy colony. Spathy, all right. ICOM offline. Let's go to Goshen. I'm going to actually wait until... I have enough fuel. Okay, that is a return trip. Let's go talk to the Spathy. These guys are great. Ooh, is it that wakes me from my safe and happy sleep at this time of our new solar cycle? This is especially rude since my physical system is not yet adjusted to the new day length. Pots out the sun and threatens to rain down radioactive death upon us! Oh no! Compounding my fright is the hideous bloated green monster that looms before me on the view screen! Our end is at hand! We surrender, oh merciful evil alien! I, Nifawan, rage into the ruling council of the Spathy colonists, officially surrender. We will reveal all League secrets to you and give you all our storehouse of minerals. Would you like to know the weaknesses of the captain of the League? He is a megalomaniacal tyrant. Bro. But a softy for polite rules of colonization. He's a sucker about forgiving his allies for any sort of indiscretion. Now please don't... Wait. Heko. Who has been fiddling with the color and contrast controls of my view screen? This is the second time this week! Yikes! It is the Hunam Captain of the League of Sentient Races! I didn't mean it, Captain! So, my skin turns green and he gets ready to sell me- sell out everything? Let's see, which one am I gonna want to say? Uh... I'm gonna smack you. Please, don't smack me! I have a low pain threshold. I have a rare disease that makes my soft flesh bruise easily. I could easily expire from even a small tap. And then who would feed my thousand encrustlings? So planning to reveal League secrets? Never. Never. We were attempting to deceive an enemy. Would you really surrender that easily? I was not really going to surrender. It was a ruse. A ruse designed to lull the foe into a false sense of security until we could plan a daring and ultimately suicidal mission in which we would all die in agony before we would reveal a word of League secrets. Light rules, a softie. Uh, uh, 
was a figure of speech. If the enemy were to think of you as a softy, they would underestimate you. Then you could easily destroy them. We were trying to misinform the enemy by calling you a softy. That was our story, and even in the face of the worst torture, we were prepared to stick with it. <laughs> we'll let this slide at least for now. Wonderful. In truth, just between us, I have been quite ill at ease since your warp bubble transport hurtled us off into the void of the Kasari Quadrant like some castaway petal claw covering. Yet now, I find myself enjoying your company, your sparkling conversation, and, and the presence of your huge, powerful, death-dealing starship, which, being my friend, you would certainly feel compelled to use in order to save me from any hostile life forms who threaten me with death. Oh yeah, by the way, um, this is 1996. Uh, these guys aren't CG. This is, they actually use puppets. Uh, for all of the alien species. That's why they, they kind of look pretty decent. Although there are some puppets that look worse than others. But I like these guys. Uh, have a good night, Admiral Paco. You, uh, uh, thanks for stopping by. Okay, let's see. Uh, I don't, I forgot what he was saying, but let, um, only if you behave yourselves and show a little backbone. Of course, we have to protect all the League races to a thing pet. Let's say only if you behave yourselves and show a little backbone. You were ready to sell me out the second you thought I was someone else. We rejoice! Did we mention that we are enjoying your company? I'd like an update on your status, Niffy One. Well, you see, it's like this. When we first arrived, we were terrified to step out onto the surface of our designated planet. Savage beasts freely roamed the surface, gnawing the abundant tubers and root crops with massive forefangs. We did not dare set our petal claws on that surface. These horrible pink-eyed creatures scattered at the sight of us, as if to regroup for a massive assault. We could see them lurking behind the abundant ground cover, their flop ears twitching menacingly, as if to signal an ambush. It was only after we incinerated several thousand of them with our beam weapons that we discovered... Surprise! They were just gentle herbivores. Imagine our relief. <laughs> so we were a little late in getting started colonizing. We have not produced too many Eluda ships for you. But even now, our teams are hard at work. You guys were afraid of a bunch of bunnies? Not bunnies. Huge, furry rodents with massive fangs. Okay. Bunnies. My lord, but you guys are a bunch of cowards. Are all spathy this cowardly? Yes, absolutely, and with no qualifications. This system has kept us alive for millennia, and we see no reason to change it now, except to do what we promised and help keep the galaxy alive. But once the galaxy is feeling better, it's back to safety for us. <laughs> I have some more important questions. What is it you wish to know? We will try to answer, but please don't be offended with us if we don't have every answer to every question. I have come to get some eluders. So we know you intend to seize the fruits of spathy adulthood and whisk them off into the trackless reaches of space and launch them against monstrous, slavering aliens who drool for the tender gush of sweet, spathy flesh between their fangs. We will comply. Tell me about your eluders' void ships. Our exquisite eluder void ship is fast and maneuverable, with powerful engines that can outrun many kinds of enemy ships. We have a short-range front gun and a very powerful rear weapon, the famed Backward Utilized Tracking Torpedoes. This ship is brilliantly designed for one purpose, running away. We are always willing to run away from a fight, and if any opponent is ill-mannered enough to pursue us, we run away while lobbing B-U-T-T -T missiles at them. <laughs> of course, we are willing to gird our haunches and force ourselves to fight for the League. In such cases, we like to stay comfortably out of range and pop in occasionally to launch a missile. I love the design of their ship. It's, um, I'll have to pull it out next time I, I uh, get in a fight. Tell me about your species. We spatty can best be described as meta-mollusks. We are intelligent and clever, 
but perhaps not very cunning. Each day when we awaken, we call forth the traditional spathy prayer. Oh God, please don't let me die today. Tomorrow would be so much better. I love these guys so much. Tell me about the history of the spathy. I will now relate the tragic history of our species. This is a sad tale, so do not even try to contain your tears. Once upon a time, many thousands of years ago, we inhabited the warm, safe surface of our home planet, Spatiwa. We were happy and content. During those golden centuries, we Spathy evolved into a simple folk, content with our calm agrarian lives, our rude huts, and our coarse woven turtleneck sweaters. We could have remained that way for eons. Were it not for the sudden arrival of a million voracious monsters from hell, darkness fell upon us. The evil ones came. These frightening, ursan creatures hunted our people and devoured them like tasty nobules. We had no defense against them. Where did they come from? We have never quite figured that out. The few evil one specimens we collected, who had mostly died of tooth decay from eating sweet, spathy flesh, were physiologically unlike any other species from our home planet. It was as though they had arrived suddenly on the surface of our planet, transported there by some unknown agency. Who could be so cruel? Perhaps it was our gelatinous prankster neighbors, the Umga. Good thing they aren't in the league. What'd you do next? We fled across the oceans, from continent to continent, but the evil ones always followed. Spurred by our great need, we advanced from simple tool making to atomic technology in less than one Earth century. <laughs> but none of our innovations was a match for the evil one's natural cunning and ferocity. Finally, with no other option available, we fled our world and took up residence on our moon, where we resided most uncomfortably for 300 years. Though we gained interstellar travel, we tended to stay close to home, preferably in the living room. So we learned little about other races beyond our neighbors, like the Andresynth. We thought we were finally safe and began to emerge from our shell cases and relax our bodies, which were nearing toxic levels of adrenaline poisoning. Then, the Urquan arrived. Uh, tell me about the Androsynth. In our home quadrant, where we felt safer than we do now, though still not very safe, Androsynth space bordered our own. The Androsynth said they were clones of your Hunam race. While we never really liked the Androsynth, it seemed that they weren't out to kill us as everyone else seemed to be. So imagine our shock when we learned that they had been invaded and eaten by those fish folk. The oars. Oh, we'll see the oars. The oars ate them? Well, actually, we don't know if the oars ate anybody, but we're sure they did something creepy. We're nervous about being in the league with the oars, since they seem so dangerous. Yeah, I think um, in Star Control 2, like, the Androsynth just disappeared and in, in their system, just suddenly the ores appeared in their place. Like, the hitch has been completely replaced. The, the ores are a fun species. We'll get to them. What proof do you have of this? Oh, are you a stickler for details like proof? How do you ever get anything done? Proof? We cannot supply, but you must admit those ores are unnerving. Please keep them away from us. You know how sweet and tasty spat they are to predatory creatures? What happened next? In the years after our escape from the evil ones, we created many complex rituals to keep us safe from any future predators. But none of them worked. The Urquan arrived at Spathiwa and held a great ceremony. Part of that ceremony involved blasting portions of our planet's surface into radioactive dust, and this part we did not enjoy. But the worst was yet to come. The Urquan explained our options as new slaves. 
We could serve as fighting slaves or have our world be forever encased in an impenetrable energy shield. We grew overexcited at the slave shield option since it would make us safer than we were. Monsters could not pop in by surprise if we were shielded. We eagerly transmitted our decision to the Urquan, but the Urquan servant was a member of a race of gelatinous pranksters called the Umga. The Umga saw how eager we were to be cut off from the galaxy's wars and told the Urquan that we wanted to become fighting slaves. Oh, that's we evil. We tried to explain the disastrous mistake. But the strict Urquan bureaucracy had no mechanism to allow any such change in status. Following that most tragic day, we were forced to assume the role of an Urquan star thug. I can't imagine you guys were very good at it. What'd you do to the Umga? Not much. Well, I take that back. We did take away their hyperwave caster, which they were using to frighten us and many other races. We gave the caster to you, and you used it to save the galaxy. Well, maybe not save the galaxy directly, but it helped you save the galaxy. Are you taking credit for my victory over the Urquan? No, no, no. Yes, a little. We'll stop. <laughs> so what happened next? For many years, we boldly attacked countless horrible threats in daring space combat. Well, not really. We mostly performed garrison duty on stations with little strategic value, like slave-shielded planets full of weak but tricky races. Races like you Hunans. But then, you came along and eradicated the evil ones from the face of Spathifa and sent them back to the pits of hell. You ended their relentless passion for our fleshy parts. We joined your war against the Urquan, but soon found out how to make a slave shield of our own. We used it to encase ourselves away from the Urquan and uh, uh, also away from you. <laughs> Sounds about we right. We out for the rest of the war which our prognosticators ensured us would last at least 600 years. Imagine our surprise when frightening-looking Chamur burst our precious slave shield like a soap bubble and announced that we were free. We were not disturbed at the breakdown of hyperspace. Now, perhaps, scary big races would leave the Spathy alone to enjoy our simple pleasures. But you had to go and tell us that the whole galaxy would break down next. You plucked at some long hidden cords of courage within us. And now, here we are. And if I may say so, Captain, it was the singularly worst idea we have ever had. I want to go home. I want to go home. <laughs> Fuck up there, little Spaffy. We will carry on with our mission. What is it you wish to know? We will. Okay, uh, what do you know about the Precursors? We have found traces of the Precursors scattered throughout our space. Our belief is that the Precursors are not really gone. They simply came to their senses one day. They realized what a dangerous place the galaxy is and used their superior technology to invent some kind of splendid invisibility shield and remain alive and happy to this day in our very midst. We hope to rediscover this secret someday and disappear into similar obscurity. Oh, very good. Keep up the good work, Spaffy. Must you take your sheltering, protective precursor vessel away from our sky so soon? Very well. But return soon, Captain. All right, let's pick up my, uh, the Spaffy ships. Um, I'm just gonna grab, like, 20 of you guys because I'm not gonna be building any yeah, I can't get an exact... I just want enough so that I can, like, use them to get dig sites. That maxed out. And where to next? ICOM online. A signal received from an emitter on a Starte 1 confirms the presence of a Sirene colony. Sirene! ICOM offline. Let's go. That's a Starte. Can't reach there yet. Let's see what fuel. Ooh, that's no. I want the fuel. 
You only have 684. All right, let's uh, speed up the time then. What do we got? Pay dirt. Captain, we've found a large cache of precursor records about genetic engineering. Evolutionary development of sentient and non-sentient species appears to be a consuming passion for them. We'll continue to update you as we translate them. Excellent work. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, once, uh, when I have my next combat, I will pull out a spaffy ship so you can see. Oh, I can make it to Astarte, but it's a one-way trip for now. Let's, actually, you've got a bunch of fuel. Let's pick you up. Hi, Captain. How can we help? Uh, oh, you've got a new option. Tell me about the precursors. We don't know what is legend and what is truth. But the information points to a great and powerful race that developed miraculous technology, uncovered amazing secrets of time and space, and then disappeared. They left behind few clues about who they were, but lots of technology. We suspect that they were huge, hulking creatures. And like us, they were concerned with the stability of the fabric of space. Hopefully, we'll find full records on them and save the galaxy before we meet their fate. All right. Talk to you soon, Captain. And I... Yeah, I'm gonna... Oh, Astarte is now... Here, let me slow down the time. Let's talk to the Siren, who have the worst puppet in the game. Hello, brave Earthling. I am Colony Commander Lelore, and I welcome you to our new homeworld in the Kasari Quadrant. Your warp bubble transport worked perfectly as we knew it would. We're glad that you have found us so soon. We're eager to begin colonizing other worlds for you and help you shoulder your heavy responsibilities. <clears throat> shoulder as much as you want, but first I'd like an update on your status, Cyrene. Our colonizing teams have set to work with enthusiasm. We are exceeding all our productivity goals and creating new penetrator ships in order to meet your exacting demands. It, it, she's not only supposed to be humanoid, like, the Sirene are basically just blue humans. But, like, this is a really ugly puppet. Really ugly puppet. Those powerful penetrators will come in handy. I'll make sure to load up. Captain, we recognize the difficult task that lies ahead. Restoring the fabric of space may require a Herculean effort. We want you to know that we are ready to help you in any way we can. Oh, hang on just a second. I need to make sure I just realized I had uh, x Patter still open and I didn't want to bump it and accidentally, because I had x Patter uh, remapping my controller and I didn't want to bump it and accidentally hit some weird command. Okay, so tell me about your penetrator vessels. We Sirene have a unique set of psionic abilities that are amplified by our penetrator ships. We can broadcast a signal so compelling that all sentient creatures in its range willingly abandon their ships to come fight for us as mind-controlled drones. This makes the Penetrator the only ship we know of that can leave a battle with a larger crew and in a stronger position. Tell me about the history of the Sirene. The Sirene are a race whose development is extremely close to that of humans. In both culture and biology, humans and Cyrene are almost too close a match to be just a coincidence. Like you Earthlings, our modern spacefaring society evolved from primitive tribes. Our two cultures were quite similar until they took very different paths in what would have been your prehistory. Our world continued to enjoy the differences between the genders, while your world used gender as a basis for a political dominance structure which pervaded almost all of your Earth cultures until the early 21st century. What is this politics in my video games? Um, how did your worlds develop differently? When Earth males discovered that they too had a role in the sacred process of creating children, they responded with a jealous need to imprison Earth females and hold them as property. On Syra, males and females continued to develop as equals, most likely due to the stabilizing influence of peaceful agricultural people. I see, so then what happened? Syra was our paradise, Captain. Our worlds were very much the same, at least up to the point that you began encasing yours in concrete and plastic. Like your Earth, Syra was a world of rare beauty, variety, and abundance of life. 
I say was, because it was abruptly torn apart oh, no. for most of my people. We thought it was an asteroid that struck our world. We survived the massive impact, but our world was soon torn apart in a cataclysm of earthquakes and volcanoes. Only our orbiting space patrol survived. Fewer than 10,000 females and only 500 males. You <laughs> see, wow, I mean, how... That seems like a really inappropriate way to respond. Wow, I mean, how tragic. Um... If these Sirene are so equal, how come all I see is women? Most of the Sirene space patrol is comprised of Sirene females because in our species, the females have psionic abilities suited to making special attacks on enemy crew. Sirene males do not. They have other talents. <laughs> Sirene males are fuckboys. Confirmed. I see, so then what happened? The survivors of our race began a long trek across the heavens. Searching for a another Trek? world that could match the breathtaking beauty of Syra. But our slow-moving habitat columns were attacked by Vox raiders. We had stumbled into the path of the Urquan hierarchy of battle thralls. We joined the old Alliance of Free Stars, only to see it fall apart. The Earthlings, who were the newest members of the Alliance, were defeated and placed under an Urquan slave shield. The Aralu disappeared, and other free races retreated to their homeworlds. We had no choice but to surrender and be slave shielded. That requires a planet? Where did you get a planet to be slave shielded on? Ironically, our enemies were our salvation. The Urquans searched their extensive star charts and found a perfect planet for us. Though many benighted souls confuse the Kazerza Urquan with the genocidal Urquan Kora, the green Urquan were not out to kill everyone. They just wanted to make sure that no race could pose a threat against them. Then what happened? We settled our new planet and began rebuilding our shattered population. Though we hated our loss of freedom, we loved our beautiful planet Gaia. But then you came along. You tried to get us to rebel against the Urquan. We were afraid to do so until you proved that Syra was not destroyed by a freak accident, but by the Mycon. We were furious and sought revenge against the Mycon and their Urquan masters. We joined with you in the new alliance and helped you defeat the hated hierarchy. We were very grateful to you and enjoyed watching your budding romance with Cyrene Starbase Commander Talana. Then what happened? Though we were eager to get back to our paradise on Gaia, we knew that only a strong alliance would fend off future dictators seeking to control the stars. So when hyperspace travel collapsed, we were among the first to volunteer to join your mission. And here we are. Tell me about the Precursors. We have heard many legends about the Precursors, but we do not know how to filter the lore from the lies. If a race as great as the Precursors, still exists in known space. They do an incredible job of hiding the psychic residue of their vast intellects. Very good. Keep up the good work, Cyrene. Until next time, Captain. Pick up your ships. Grab a couple of your crew. Bump up all of your sliders. Icom, where to next? ICOM online. A signal received from an emitter on Salacia 2 confirms the presence of a Vux colony. Okay. ICOM offline. How's my... Salacia's there. Okay, let's just bump up the speed. Let's get more gas. Come on, give me a round trip. We haven't yet found any evidence of the Supox, Chimur, Mykon, Pekunk, Urquan, Utwig, Vux, or Ors in the Kazari Quadrant. Okay. What do we got? These genetic engineering records show that the precursors were seeking to quantify the environmental and genetic forces that shape sentience. They hypothesize that for sentience to develop so similarly in that many races, there must be a universal tendency toward developing sentience. They hint at some dark and ominous trend here, but we don't fully understand the reference. 
they believe that great individuals in all sentient races appear to make great breakthroughs that advance the whole race, one or a few advance, and then the whole race suddenly lurches forward. We can't translate the word they use for this potential in sentient beings, so we're calling it precursor potential. That just sounds like great man theory. Thanks for the help. Will do, sir. Uh... Okay, so 140 parsecs, so once the green line gets out to here, I will be able to go to Salacia. I mean, I can go to Salacia now, but I want to have enough gas for a return trip. And you know what, that's good enough. They'll have gas there. Let's go. Oh, I picked up their ships. Let's go. Let's talk to them. Hello? 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 Is our good friend the human there? Oh, there you are. My view screen must not have been working. How pleasant to look upon you again. Greetings, Captain of the League of Sentient Races. Greetings from the Bucks Colonists. I, Admiral Dox, welcome you to our colony. We were wondering when you would get here. I'm here now. Give me an update on your status, Dox. Vox power plants operate at peak efficiency, of course. We had quite a successful rollout of our extraordinary ship, the Intruder. And we are ready to cause immense torrents of pain in all who irritate the Vox. <laughs> the lead. I'll just help myself to those intruders. Please help yourself. Nothing we like more than to give the fruits of our labor to our good friend, the human. I'm glad you have changed your ways from when you were a vicious member of the hierarchy. Yes, 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 that's all behind us. We are no longer revolted at the sight of humans and other sentients. See? I have been looking upon you for minutes without gagging on my own stomach acids. Hey, it's Freddy Bo. Welcome in. Before I am here and you could not sleep, what is this nightmare? This nightmare is the Vux. I am playing Star Control 3, a game from 1996. And let's see, uh, what do I want to say? Yeah, good, because during the war I had to show you Vux the error of your bigoted ways, and I'd hate to have to stomp you again. Captain, you wound us. We Vux seek only peaceful coexistence with you. We are gleeful members of the League. We seek only the best for our good friend. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because the League needs every race if we're going to stabilize the galaxy. We will need lots of habitable worlds with great resources in order to assist you best. We'd like to make sure that you allocate plenty of resources to us. Yeah, sure. We have some questions, though. Please inform the Bucks of the manner in which we can best assist our good friend, the Human Captain. I've come for some intruders. I really don't see how we can keep producing enough to satisfy you when you allocate so few resources to us. But you can take some. I literally just got here. Tell me about the Vux Intruders. The Intruder is only the most exquisite fighting vessel. From its resplendent front laser to its organic limpets, it is the model of perfection. The limpets home in on an enemy ship and clap on, slowing the enemy. Rather than trying to match our enemy speeds, we slow ships down. We enjoy obstructing their progress and functioning. What a delight to watch their frustration. <laughs> the uh, intruder actually really sucks as a ship. Um, it's basically only good as an ambush thing because uh, if you spawn in an intruder, it will spawn in uh, right at the, uh, the enemy ship. So if you spawn in, hold fire right from the start and you can sometimes just one shot them if they don't react enough in time and move away. But if they get clear of your laser, you're pretty much done for. Those limpets are worthless. Tell me about the history of the Vux. You know our history. You were, uh, excuse me. Now then, 
allow me to regale you with the amazing saga of the books. We were a mighty starfaring race even before the coming of the Urquan. The hierarchy forced us to maim and destroy and enslave other worlds. Do you think for a moment that we enjoyed it? Well, perhaps just a little. But what we really enjoy is working for you. Do you think I should trust this guy? <laughs> uh, get on with the story. Anyway, working with the Urquad was difficult because so many races were so very nauseating to the Bucks. But we managed. However, then we met the humans who were a whole new dimension in ugliness. You were so repulsive. And by you, I mean all humans, of course. You were so repulsive that we hated you on sight. We pretended that we were mortally offended by a rude insult made by the first humans we met and used the insult as an excuse to justify our hate. But then we met you. Go on. You were flying around in your previous precursor vessel. You seem to have a habit of having lots of precursor vessels. The Bucks fought you, but just couldn't quite fully pulverize you. <clears throat> All we wanted was to stop looking at you. But you kept on apologizing for the insult. Over and over again. We had to keep looking at you. Finally, we broke down and confessed that we would never join you. Not because of any insult, but because of your vomitous appearance. So, you guys are bigots. Got it. Go on. But your persistence also allowed you to learn the whereabouts of that monstrous Vox Herbert. Admiral Zex, who was so twisted that he actually liked the look of humans. The wicked Zex actually helped you to defeat the hierarchy. But now we are your allies, and all that foolishness is forgotten. <laughs> you still call Zex an enemy, though, even though he was on our side and you're ostensibly on our side. These guys aren't doing a very good job of convincing me they're on my side. Are you really over your prejudices? It is true that we were once disgusted by you, but now the sight of your face is so pleasing. The way the smooth skin is creased around the two tiny eye sockets, and the way the feed hole gapes open with corners upturned to reveal internal nubs of calcified bone protrusions makes me wanna... Excuse me... Makes me so happy. Yes, happy! So you see, we cannot be bigoted against you anymore. That sounds like I'm not transphobic. I masturbate to lots of trans porn. <laughs> How is it that you were able to overcome such deep-seated bigotry against other races? Oh, we overcame our bigotry through pure thoughts, clean living, and hard work. Speaking of hard work, we need to work harder! We need more resources and more worlds to really work hard! Uh, Freddy says, voice acting is so dumb, but it's not bad somehow. Yeah, I no, I like it. Um, It's very silly, it's very goofy, but I think it, it fits them pretty well. Really hard work consists of making do with what you have. Now, back to questions. Please inform the book. Okay, we're just back to the main thing. What do you know about the Precursors in Rainbow Worlds? The Precursors were old and powerful, but not too powerful to keep from dying. So they are useless. And Rainbow Worlds? Sparkly bubbles. Please. See you later, Admiral. 
later. Later is good. All right. Grab a couple of you guys. Get your sliders going. Oh, I don't need the time to go that fast. Where next? Icon. A signal received from an emitter on Janus 8 confirms the presence of a Micon colony. Micon are next, but there is an anomaly here with a Dak Tak Lack Pack. Dak Tak Lack Pack 5576 squared. Dak Tak Lack Pack 888 warning. Utilization to the 356th power divided by warning. Dak Tak Lack Pack warning. Well, it is Star Control 3, so you're not wrong, Freddy. Uh, so I've tried these options and they didn't work. Could you at least make an effort to sound intelligible? Dak Dak Lack Pack 5299 and 58X. Dak Dak Lack Pack. Warning 321B. Avowal. Dak Dak Lack Pack. Um, I can't understand you. Inversion 982 Torque. Dak Dak Lack Pack. Okay. We're going to pull out the Spathy because they've got the BUTT missiles. Let's see. Let's get by this guy. <laughs> they even make a fart noise. Come on. Oh, would you stop running from me? Oh boy. I don't want to get... Come on. Let's go. Oof. One more hit. I blew him up. All right. And we've got here. Guess we're doing the Vux because everything else is like zero bars. Go back to the Vux, get some more fuel. Captain, we want more worlds. We clearly have fewer on average than the other races. I, dude, I haven't even left your system yet. I just went to get a thing. Uh, what should I say? You Vux are very understanding. We ask you to be understanding a little longer. Oh, very well. For now. See you later, Admiral. Later. Later is good. Okay, so I need to get to the mic on. Let's pick up the ships first. What do we got? A cold rock spinning silently in the void. A womb for the deep children. Your arrival is appropriate. Acceptable new worlds are a priority for the rapid and complete spread of Juffawup. We aid Juffawup by bringing forth the deep children. Uh, good. Uh, that That's good. Can I get an update on your status, Mycon? I am Asho. I am the purity monitor. I choose what buds are permitted to mature and which must be eradicated. I died of a faulty energy filtration system 62,443 years ago. Um... If you died that long ago, how are you talking to me? Um, I mean, an update on your colonies. I root deep in the soil. My deep children will be well nurtured. More pod ships will grow. The cycle continues. So progresses Juffawop. You guys are still not very easy to understand. We look to Juffawop for direction. Uh... Great. Fine. I have some questions. We are the Mycon. We respond. I've come for some of your Mycon pod chips. When we encounter the Nan, we must absorb the Nan or reject the Nan so that it is no longer Nan. The pod ship joins with you. Survival is a priority. Expansion is a priority. 
processing is a priority. What? What was that last bit? Reject the non. Join with the pod ships. His voice totally changed there. All right, tell me about your pod ships. The pod ships thrum with the plasma containment field whose offspring seek to transform the non nice, to Zoe. void. The fields grow tighter and tighter the base rumble of the generators rising gradually to a high burning scream sudden Silence and a flash of light announce. Release the hot pulsing subside slowly. That was, um, word salad. That's supposed to be useful? We are the Micon. We respond. Why does this character look like, you know what, never mind. They're supposed to be kind of like a fungal race. Um, but yeah, I, he definitely looks kind of like that, yeah. Uh, tell me about the Mycon race. Mycon are keepers of the deep children. Mycon spread Juffawop. Juffawop acknowledges the existence of unvoidable non. When we are faced with such, we join, absorb, and wait for our opportunity to learn the weakness that will allow us to void the non. Uh, tell us about this Jeffo Wup. When Jeffo Wup is complete, when at last there is no void or non, when the creators return, then we can finally rest. Creators? What creators? We look to Juffelwop for direction, and it provides the pattern endless expansion with purity of achievement and intolerance of error. Look. Think. Does that voice change again? Act. Look. Learn. Remember. Teach. Look. Think. Um, I'm not gonna read that word because if this was written in a different time. I'm not gonna say that word, but I will click it. What you uh did that out there for a minute? We look to Juffo up for direction. We are the Micon. We respond. Um. Actually, let me go back to this. Mike. Um. Because there's more options. Okay, uh, how about the non and void? What's that? When we encounter the non, we must absorb the non or reject the non so that it is no longer non. Helpful. Why do you talk so strangely? Our bodies seethe with the passion of our genes. A thousand of your species do not possess the richness in one of my cells. Uh, tell us about the Deep Children. The Deep Children are part of Juffowup, home builders, the dwellers in the Mohorovichik. I have chosen my offspring's memories carefully from my set of remembrances. The sweet and warm times of my existence and those of my parents' parents' parents. The bits of a million lifetimes coalesced into a birth gift of complete awareness. The deep children fall from the void, gathering speed for the penetration. The tough casing warms as it passes through the atmosphere. Glowing white as it hits the surface, solid rock flows like liquid, and the child slips into the warm, safe depths beneath the crust. Okay, so that would explain his line earlier when he said he died 60,000 years ago because it sounds like they um, impart some of their memories onto their children. All right, tell us about your origins. Our bodies seethe with the passion of our genes. A thousand of your species do not possess the richness in one of my cells. I fill with my parents, 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 parents. I am they. They are us, then and now. 
I have a question on another topic. We are the Micon. We respond. What do you know about the precursors? We look to Jopowop for direction, and it provides the pattern endless expansion. Oh, we've heard this line. Of achievement and intolerance of error. Look, think, act, look, learn, remember, teach, look, think. I have a different question. We are the Mi- Okay, that's everything. Keep up the good work, Mycon. Bye. The deep children, spears of light in the darkness, their discarded husks speak of joy to come. Here. Uh, let's grab 20 of you guys. 20, thank you. And let's get everything maxed out here. And there's an anomaly here. Let's go take a look at that. Dak dak lack back five five seven six squared. Dak dak lack back eight 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 warning. Utilization to the three hundred fifty six power divided by warning. Dak dak lack back warning. Okay, you're not sentient, are you? Dak dak lack back five two nine nine and five eight x. Dak dak lack back warning three two one b avowal. Dak dak lack back. And I have exhausted all my dialogue options with him, so he is just... Inversion, 982 Torque, Dak Dak Lack Pack. Can't talk to him. some humans down there. Get some more fuel. I yearn for magma, the flowing warm basalt, the red glow of the lava pools. We are the mic. Okay, got Pulse. it. Um... I only have two pods left. Icom online. Um, please repeat your last message, Icom. We haven't yet found any evidence of the Supox, Shimmer, Kunk, Urquan, Utwig, or Orzenik. Sorry, Codden. Okay, let's uh get another hint then. Icom. This is getting complicated. Help. A signal received from an emitter on Arcadia 6 confirms the presence of a Pekunk colony. Oh, the Pekunk are fun. Icom off. Uh, can I make it to Arcadia? Yeah. Actually, I think... Ooh. Uh, let's go to Earth. There's a bunch of fuel here. Hi, Captain. How can we help? Got what I need. Yeah, okay. I should be able to go round trip to Arcadia soon. Just speed up the time. Come on. There we go. Slow down the time. Go talk to the Pekunk. Joyous Have day. a good night, Zoe. The Earthling friend is once again in our midst. Greetings and various apropos felicitations, Captain. Welcome to the Kasari Quadrant home of the gentle and playful Pekunk. Children of the cosmic light. Hobgoblins of joy. Seekers of spiritual truth. And other neat stuff like that. I am Fesser, eldest soul among the Pekunk colonists. I'll be your spiritual advisor for this mission. Auspicious portents and serendipitous omens have foretold your arrival. That, and you told us you would be stopping by to check in on us after we took our magic carpet ride to the Kasari Quadrant on your Warp Bubble Express. And here you are, like the riffle bird that scatters its eggs to other nests and then jealously snatches them all back, 
You've tossed the League ships to the cosmic winds and then come back to redeem us. Like, wow, man. When you say such adorable things, we cannot help but love you. That's great. Give me an update on your status, Fezzer. Our status is joy. Sheer joy for all. Share our joy. Share our love. Are we not, Pakunk? Yes, I said we were and so we are. <laughs> I must laugh and sing for the sheer joy of it. This is our way. One thing that bugs me about their design is they're supposed to be birds, but they don't have any feathers, and you're making a puppet, so, like, you could easily stick feathers into the puppet, right? So, I don't know, that kind of bugs me. Well, that's uh, wonderful, but I need to know how your colony is progressing. Our colony is rising and advancing as an entire loving group through many cycles of sweet surrender to both our base urges and our highest spiritual longing. Oh, they fucking... We dream and trance together. That all our spirits may rise as one big soul with smooth edges and no lumps. Come on, Kunk, be specific. I want to know the material status of the tangible conditions of the physical aspects of the colonizing. We know what you want to hear, Captain. We are not known throughout the galactic sector as powerful psychics for nothing. Of course, we also know the answer to your next question. But we enjoy conversation so much, we'll wait for you to ask it. Um, oh yeah? Then tell me what my, what my next question is going to be. We know what you want to know, but we tell you what you need to know. Information on all those material resources and other thingamajigs are so much silly debris. What I need is ships. Lots of them. Like your Pekunk Fury, for instance. Ships? I look into your soul and I see many, many ships. A trance descends upon me, largely unbidden, I might add, since I did not schedule a trance until after my macrame class this evening. <laughs> In this trance, I see you getting ships. Many ships. Many, many ships. Goodness, but you are going to go through a whole mess of ships. Yes, indeedy dee, but you are going to cause a colossal amount of ships to get blown up. Immolated, fireballed, shredded, and otherwise annihilated. Yes, siree. Lots of smashed hulks of twisted scrap metal languidly rotating through the chilly, inky depths of space in an obscene tap dance of desolation. Once pulsing veins of the crew members now spewing out countless tiny sparkling shards of blood droplets frozen to near absolute zero. Another hundred centuries will never this. again preen the pin feathers of their offspring. Oh, woogie. Where was I? Oh, yes. Certainly you may have our ships. Since you are our friend, our good friend, take all the Pekunk Furies you want. We'll fill them with crew right away. You expect me to send Pekunk into battle after that? Why, of course. Blessed silly captain! We are not just along for the ride. We are willing to do our part for the cause of your enlightened league, silly! Uh, okay, thanks. Good. Now let us discuss the mysteries of the universe. I was just reflecting upon them myself during my midday grub break. The lush huge fruit has a beautiful bloom, does it not? The invisible fairy spirits caper within its fronds and waggle their tongues in a saucy insouciance. Don't you adore the lush, huge fruit? I'm afraid I've never been privileged to see one. I will have my nest mate transplant one for you immediately. We will water it in your name. Um, let's see... I'll look forward to that moment. I'm trying to be polite. <laughs> Your aura is now shot through with such crinkly stains of burnt sienna. But how could that be? That is a sign of annoyance. And we are having such a lovely conversation. That is a sign of some inner deficiency. What do you lack? Um, uh, <laughs> serious answers. How may I enlighten you at this moment, Captain? Uh, what do you know about the Precursors? Although some believe that we Pekunk are the Precursors, we always shake our heads in that delightful way that makes our necks feel such a nice stretch and say, if we were the Precursors, wouldn't we know about it? 
Hello. Perhaps the precursors were our spiritual forebears. We still feel the ripple of their greatness on the celestial winds. The precursors became sufficiently enlightened to know that all their great creations did not bring them salvation and progressed to another configuration of being. I'd like some information about your race. Oh, a wise question. But where to begin? Tell me about your unique ship. The Pekunk Fury is a small ship with a small crew complement, but it is filled with special magical touches guaranteed to excite you. It has a rapid-fire minigun that spits a stream of dense, superheated metal. You can command the Fury to run past your opponents and make a lovely broadside attack, or spin in place while firing to create the ever-popular Death Blossom. But wait, there's more. Since we Pekunk are in tune with the harmonies of the universe, we are always able to transcend to the next level of consciousness following the abrupt discorporation of our physical bodies. If an entire crew chooses, they can reincarnate instantly in the middle of battle and bring their ship to... Now you would normally expect to pay 5,000 resource units for all this, but wait, there's more. You can also command the crew to insult the enemy with many impertinent jibes. What good does that do? Why, it causes us to create copious amounts of psychic energy. You generate psychic energy through insults? Unlike certain other species, we become are inherently peaceful and loving people. Combat does not come easily to us. In order to be at all effective, we find it necessary to whip ourselves into an emotional frenzy. I'm definitely going to have to pull out the uh, the Kunk Fury in, in my next fight so you, you guys can see it. Because uh, uh, its energy doesn't generate naturally. You have to use the insults to generate it. And uh, they're very funny insults. Um, how would you describe your race? We are hatchlings of light. Spiritual soul beings of the vast cosmic oneness. Wayfarers on the river of destiny. Students of the mystical dimensions, purveyors of blissful love, bird-like manifestations of glorious light energies from the astral plane. How would you describe your culture? Just off the top of my beak, I suppose I would say that our culture could be defined as the ultimate unification, or oneness, if you will, of the extra-dimensional convergent chakra being energies to form a togetherness self which both is and is not a culmination of the now essence. Tell us your history. Though it surprises many to hear it, the Pekunk were once brutal birds of prey, oblivious to the mysteries of the crystal magic or the seven dimensions of psychic beings. It was not until Weenie Wiki Wiki Birdie sat on the mystical egg of ice-like temperature and gave the original squawk whoop, 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 that our transformation began. It triggered the harmonic oscillations that would lead us to become the enlightened avians that we are. But alas, not all our race saw the light. Why not? Some of us were not ready for such revelations and refused to hear the calling in their souls. And so, the Bakunk and the Yeehot divided into two separate people. We loved our crappy and violent Yeehot brothers and sisters whereas they would open fire on our vessels on sight. Fortunately, our psychic abilities allowed us to sense the deep abiding love and yes, even shyness in our Yeehot brothers and sisters. So we never gave up on them. Even when, in a moment hey, of tipster. spiritual impoverishment, the Yeehot Vipneep Queen joined forces with the Urquan hierarchy. Oh no! But many of her people would not follow that path. And then you fomented revolution within the Yeehot. Well, it, I, I love that this is the third game, but it assumes you haven't played the last ones, so it gives you the options to just have other people tell you what you did. My mom gay? True. What happened then? A light dawned in the barren landscape of their souls. Warring had made them blind to the powers of divination and crystal magic. In the midst of a fierce battle between Pekunk and Yeehot vessels, the Yeehot Captain Yaguo remarked that the brave Pekunk captain facing him reminded him of a long-lost birdling. After a brief period of reacquaintance, 
They saw the error in their ways and welcomed us with wings outstretched, beaks stuffed with grubs. Now we are as one. The noble Pukanka conjoined with their long-lost Yeehot sisters and brothers. And then our reunited race rushed to the Sumatra battleship to help you fight your way through the enemy ships and win the day. Isn't it splendid? It's exactly as our vision said it would be. Hipster says I am the gayest of fesh. That is uh, that is true. Uh, and these guys are this, um, the highest of birds. Is it true that you can really see into the future? Why, yes, we... Uh, wait. A vision comes to me. A shining light. A crack in the egg. I am not an egg. A swirling vortex. A tunnel. I see my past lives. Your past lives. More shining light. Oh, there it is now. The future. It's coming in clearer. Yes, I see the fabric of space tearing. Open. Yeah, they needed to give it feathers. The universe bleeds as something wicked approaches. I see eternally dark and incomprehensible void beings that teeter on the border between matter and not matter. I see the eternally dark voids emerge from a dimension beyond dimensions to feed upon us all and leave the cosmos devastated. I see you standing at the hub of an endlessly revolving wheel of light. Each light is a star. I see you shake your infinitesimally tiny fist at the eternally dark voids. I see you employ many gadgets of ancient origin to forestall or avert the unholy feast. And then, and then, excuse me, the vision occludes, and then, um... I see Tipster says, weren't we all, lol? <laughs> Tipster egg confirmed. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, and then I stop them from feeding, and the galaxy lives happily ever after. And then the eternally dark voids suck up the psychic energy and leave satiated, remarking to one another about the particularly savory and forgot bouquet of the local sentience. Okay, that's like a possible future, right? Hmm. No, the vision is correct. Spot on accurate. Also, you will give a race of machines that extra special feeling, if you know what I mean. And your lucky number is 23. I'm gonna fuck a machine? Alright. Uh, bye, punk. Alright, let's pick up my ships. Let's grab some Pekunk colonists. Oh, I almost had exactly 20. Come on, give me the 20. Oh my god. There we go, perfect. And let's get you guys up here. Oh, what's up? We haven't yet found any evidence of the Supox, Chimur, Urquan, Utwig, or Orzenik, sorry, Conjun. Well, damn, Jack, give me a minute. What now? Sir, we've received a distress call from the MyCon on Janus 8. Uh-oh, I'll need to get back there. But, uh, let's go and get this. And I'm going to pull out the punk ship. Back, 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 five, five, seven, six, square. Yeah, yeah, we know all of this back, back, is just... Inversion. All right. Punk time. Back, back. Idiot. Loser. Worm. Twit. Fool. Back. Twit. Fool. Idiot. Fool. Stupid. Loser. Twit. Worm. Moron. Nitwit. Moron. Dodo. Nitwit. Worm. Fool. Worm. Wimp. Baby. Fool. Dodo. Baby. Dodo. Stupid. Nerd. Idiot. Nitwit. Moron. Idiot. Nerd. Oops. Twit. Loser. Fool. Jerk. Stupid. I almost nerd. hit that planet. Jerk. Twit. Okay, nerd. I got a couple more Fool. hits on him. Wimp. Nerd. Twit. Dodo. Worm. Fool. Loser. Moron. Fool. Wimp. Nerd. Idiot. I'm glad Loser. these guys don't have Loser. a ranged Loser. attack. Moron. Wimp. Jerk, nerd, wimp, twit, fool, twit, nerd, loser, idiot, nerd, jerk, idiot, baby, nitwit, wimp, fool, nitwit, idiot, fool, moron, fool, worm, baby, wimp, stupid, jerk, nerd, loser, idiot, moron, dodo, nitwit, loser, 
yeah, the the insults are how you gain um uh uh energy for attacks. All right, picked up that. Let's go back to the conk because I'm gonna need some fuel because I need to get to Janice and find out what's going on. Captain, I was just thinking of you, and lo, you appear. Oh, but I see you are not the least surprised by this, and why should you be? Amazing psychic occurrences are the daily bread and mashworm jelly for us, the gunk. I am filled with love at the sight of you. Perhaps we can converse together, or just coexist for a few special moments. Uh, I think you may be mistaking a coincidence for a psychic occurrence. I sense that you are cautious. You feel that you are not yet ready to enter into the fullness of our compassion. I say to you, let go. You have come here seeking an end to emptiness. How may we enlighten you? I'll catch you later, duty calls. All right. Can I make it back to the Micon system? Uh, it's a one-way trip, but uh, they did seem urgent. What's up? The Nan steal resources from the womb of the Deep Children. The Nan must become void. Uh, who is stealing what? Juffowup is all, but they are not part of Juffowup. They must be removed. Uh, this must be a translator problem. Got a mic on Human Dictionary? We are the Mycon. We respond. So I came back here and you've got the non stole something from you. I don't know who the non are. Pulsing hot liquid flows through my Blah blah blah. Um I Okay. I don't know. Uh where's my next system to go to? I come online. A signal received from an emitter on Fomalhaut 5 confirms the presence of an Utwig colony. Fomalhaut? Icom Let's go. Is it... It's there. Uh, there should be some fuel there when I get there, because it's been like a month. Let's go... Yeah, I've got one pod. Let's get this first. Blah, 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 blah. Blow you up. Yeah, I found that if I use the precursor vessel and just hold uh, right and up so that I spin and hold alt, which is my um, the, the, the fire that I use. I've got two firing options. I've got a front facing uh, missile and then a uh, shorter range um, machine gun that's holding on alt. If I just do that, like the Dak Tak Lack Pack basically never hit me. So. All right, let's pick up some Utwig ships and then let's talk to the Utwig. It is the legendary Earth Captain. A grand celebration is in order. You found our location and arrived exactly as the Ultron predicted. Even though your warp bubble transport sent us to an unknown star system, you still found us in the manner the Ultron foresaw. I am High Proctor Borogarl, and I officially announce festivities in your honor. Many Utwig now bow before you and offer their profuse greetings. Profuse greetings to you too. I'd like an update on your status. Our status is one of grim determination. Our factories churn at peak production to process resources and spew out fully armed and fully crewed juggers. After all, you will note that we have donned the stern and steely mask of determined colonization in support of galactic integrity and stabilization. Acting on wisdom from the Ultron, we have steeled ourselves to continuously wear this mask, regardless of the dangers we face. 
Even if we feel an intense need for the mask of jubilation over the vaporization of a hated foe, or the veil of sorrow following the loss of countless of our dear brother and sister Utwig in battle, we will wear this mask, and only this mask, until our mission is complete. How may the Utwig assist the glorious captain? They, um, I think in the last game they would change masks quite a bit to just signal their current mood, but they didn't want to have to make a whole bunch of different uh, render passes, or not render passes, that's right, th these are puppets. They didn't want to have to make multiple puppets for these guys, so they just have to explain why they're just wearing the one mask. Tell me about the Utwig Jugger. Like the Utwig species, the Jugger is deceptively powerful. Though Juggers look squat and ponderous, in truth, they are formidable weapons of war. Their miraculous shield can actually absorb power from enemy attacks. Once the enemy has expended its arsenal in a futile frenzy, the Jugger is charged with energy and ready for a strafing run with its front-mounted cannons. The uh, Jugger is actually, um... Oh, I was gonna say what ship it's a good counter for, but that would kind of give away some story spoilers. So I won't say, but uh, I will be pulling it out uh, when I need it. Um, tell me about the history of Yetwig. Gladly. Were it not for the gravity of our mission, I would don the mask of ineffable pride and glee over the recitation of the miraculous yet utterly factual history of the Utwig, abridged. The Utwig story begins with the early Utwig, who cavorted about our world of Foz, completely oblivious to any sort of higher purpose. We took everything at face value. But our primitive forebears were stunned by a collective realization. In a flash of religious insight, they saw that the face is the mechanism that expresses the many primitive urges that hinder sentience. They immediately and urgently donned veils of every description. Hides, leaves, shells, rocks, even living drells. We have continuously covered our faces ever since. You became more sentient from not being able to see each other's faces? Yes. Liberated from the constant reminders of greed, rage, hatred, and lust, the Utwig were able to rapidly attain a higher degree of sentience. What happened next? We suffered devastating morality riots. Over many generations, mask etiquette was refined into a rock-solid foundation of our society. Soon, all Utwig were willing to don their appropriate masks and shoulder their appropriate burdens. Once we resolved those issues, we were ready to meet our destiny. Our entire development as a sentient species culminated in the appearance of a remarkable device. The Ultron! Members of the Druge race discovered the Ultron. They were compelled by intrinsic universal direction to bring the Ultron to us. What did the Ultron do for you? The Ultron assured total and complete meaning of life for all, the universal. With the Ultron in hand, I can sense not only your motivations and desires, but your purpose. I can act upon these things in ways that would most likely seem mysterious, if not, well, daft. Within a generation, the Druge will receive their reward for bringing us the Ultron. They will be changed forever. But that is another tale. You will one day herald your interaction with the Ultron as the turning point for your species. But that's all we'll tell you about that. Uh, okay, what happened then? For a time, everything was perfect. What happened next is, well, it's difficult to talk about. The basic facts are that the Ultron fell to the ground during the Chin's Rawl celebration. As it struck the ground, I saw its glow fade and then the painful void incapacitated all. The Utwig immediately sank into a deep depression and donned masks of ultimate embarrassment and shame with a vow to wear them forever. Many Utwigs suggested that we use an ancient precursor planeteering bomb to eradicate our species. Holy shit. But we thought it more important that we suffer first. Before we could eliminate ourselves, you arrived and repaired the Ultron. We no longer needed the Precursor Bomb, and the Ultron told us to give it to you. It also told us to join with our close friends, the Supox, and fight your enemies for you. While we repelled the Urquan Korra, 
You used our bomb to destroy the Urquan's precursor battleship, the Sumatra. After that, the Udwig society became a paradise as our race evolved toward a far greater state of being. Then we agreed to <laughs> yeah, he did to almost go Jim Jones on themselves. the Ultron with us as a sign of our belief in this mission and our faith in your leadership. Then, after the war began, the Ultron was... <gasps> Oops. Sorry. The Ultron rightfully chides me for almost giving away too much. Wait, wait, what, what, what? Never mind. Uh, uh, are the Elwig taking credit for my victory over the Urquan? Never. We would sooner reveal our faces than take personal credit for victory over the Urquan. That credit belongs to the Ultron. How about to me? I did it. How do you know you're evolving toward a greater state? The Ultron told us so. They're a cult surround the, with their central religious figure being a computer. I've seen this in Star Trek multiple times. That's nice. I have this question on a different topic. How may the Utwig assist the glorious captain? Uh, any revelations from the Ultron today? The Ultron tells me that you are destined to converge on the center of the galaxy and face the ultimate evil that is trying to eat all galactic sentience. Yeah, yeah, then I stop their evil plans. I can see the future too, you know. The Ultron says that you stop them through failure. Hmm. Well, that certainly seems cryptic, even to me. Wait, what's that, Ultron? Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> now I understand. You don't stop them through failure. You fail to stop them. <laughs> what a silly misunderstanding. I see now. You will be unable to find a way to stop them, and they will greedily devour their unholy harvest while you watch. <laughs> Whew. I am so glad I straightened out that little detail before anyone was confused by it. <laughs> I like how both uh, the Utwig and the Pakunk basically say, oh yeah, no, 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 everyone's going to die. It's, it's inevitable. <laughs> Great, thanks for the vote of confidence. Anything else? The Ultron says that danger looms over the Supox expedition. Tragedy and dark places. Poor Supox. Our dear friends. Really? Does it say anything else about that? A meddlesome old friend will unexpectedly return with bad news. Anything else? The Ultron says that the Vux are a very disloyal race. Fuck, I could've they told you that. They pay lip service, or rather, snout service, to League ideals, but they hate the League and seek to destabilize it. They seek to betray you. <laughs> I mean, I believe that, but... Do you have any proof of such a serious accusation? Yes, the Ultron said so. Anything else? That's all for now. Come on, can't the Ultron just tell me something useful like what's going on with the mysterious breakdown of hyperspace? The prognosticating harmonics of the Ultron reveal a truth. We Utwig have done all that can be done to aid you. Our task must now be confined to directing the many channels of causation. Feel confident that we are using the Ultron to this end. Oh, that make, really makes me feel confident. How may the Utwig assist the glorious captain? Tell me about the Precursors. Before we had the Ultron, we had only discovered the merest traces of the Precursors. We once found one of their bombs during standard exploration procedures on a planet in our home quadrant. But our direct knowledge of the Precursors comes from the Ultron, which says that the Precursors were the most advanced race in the galaxy, they were interested in other races reaching their level of development. But they were forced to... What? Oh dear. Um... I thought I could reveal that. Cud. I'm sorry, but the Ultron says you'll find out soon enough. Please, accept my humble apology for not continuing this explanation. Uh, so it looks like I had a brief hiccup on OBS. I... Let me... Here, let me take a look. Stream health. Uh... But, uh, no. Okay. Seems like everything's alright. 
Very good. Keep up the good work, uh, Leg. The Ultron's coruscations indicate that your future actions are laced with great potential. Proceed with our heartiest endorsement. All right. Grab some of you guys. Uh, where to next? Icom online. I'd like a helpful pointer if that's at all possible. A signal received from an emitter on Valpunia 6 confirms the presence of an Urquan colony. The Urquan. Let's go. Icom offline. Uh, let's turn that off. Valpunia. 316, jeez. Um, I'm, I'm just going to go anyway, because there should be fuel there. The Irquan ships are very nice, so I'm going to grab some of those. Greetings to the captain of the League of Sentient Races from Zora, Irquan Master Number 3. I am gratified that you have located us in such short order. Though we made our voyage to the Kisari Quadrant on the wings of a new and unproven technology, our faith in you never faltered. That's great. Give me an update on your status, Zoroth. We have begun colonizing with zeal, and even now, our factories churn at full capacity to spawn our latest production model of the Dreadnought. Our fusion plasma weapons are more powerful than ever, and the warriors who fly the autonomous fighter craft launched by the Dreadnought are ever ready to die in service to the League. If they're autonomous craft, why do they need to be flown? That's... that's a contradiction. Uh, think I'll load up on some of those dreadnoughts. We will stock your precursor vessel with Urquan dreadnoughts. In return, we expect more planets for Urquan colonization. Sounds like overcompensation for the days when you guys were the greatest threat to all sentient life in the galaxy. We recognize that we have much to prove to you to atone for our all-too-recent and all-too-lengthy doctrinal wars, which you brought to an end when you defeated us and destroyed our precursor battleship, the Samatra. In our reckless zeal to carry out our misdirected doctrines, we tried to enslave or obliterate all sentient life in the galaxy. But now that is in the past and we seek to aid you in your quest for the Precursor Artifacts that will stabilize the fabric of the space-time continuum. Uh, you guys better be serious about mending your ways. I don't want to have to stomp you into the dirt again. Such antagonism will not be necessary. I'm glad to hear you say that, because the League rules of colonization are very important to a stable future for all quadrants of the galaxy. We are in alignment with you, Captain. How may the Urquan be of assistance to the elected leader of the League of Sentient Races? I was uh, being a little uh, stern with these guys since they were the bad guys in the last game. Tell me about your Dreadnoughts. The Dreadnought is a prime fighting vessel. It is the most powerful ship known in our home quadrant. The only ship to rival it in sheer firepower was the Kora Marauder. Of course, that doesn't count one-of-a-kind precursor vessels like your old one or your new one. The Dreadnought has an immensely powerful, medium to long range weapon that fires rapid fusion plasma blasts. But its strongest feature is its ability to launch autonomous fighters. The fighters each contain valuable crew members, so try not to abandon them in space. Make certain not to command the Dreadnought to launch all its fighters, or you risk leaving the Dreadnought vulnerable to a lucky enemy strike. Also, make sure not to command the ship to engage in a high-speed tactical retreat while the fighters are still harrying the foe, or the fighters will expire in space. Remember, this ship was designed by Urquan, and Urquan are unfamiliar with retreat. Their ship is so powerful. Like, I, I think their, their primary attack is one of the uh, strongest in the game. Uh, they're, they're pretty OP. <laughs> Unfamiliar with the tactical retreat? Well, maybe that's why we clobbered you. Perhaps. Tell me about the history of the Urquan. The Chronicle of the Urquan is a history of the greatest triumphs and deepest regrets. We nearly enslaved or exterminated all the races of our home quadrant as Urquan fought Urquan in the vicious doctrinal wars. In retrospect, our tragedy could have been foreseen in our origins. What do you mean? 
The Urquan evolved as solitary hunters on a hostile world, and we quickly became the dominant predator on the planet. The only threat to us came from other Urquan. Civilization did not come easily to us. We earned it by mastering the fierce territoriality and murderous desires that nearly obliterated our species in wars fought with crude clubs and wars fought with atomic weapons. But we survived our own hatreds and formed a cooperative planetary culture. This level of achievement allowed us to explore our own solar system in atomic-powered ships. Then we met the Tower. In our xenophobia and paranoia, we attacked on sight. In spite of our reckless aggression, the Tallow had glacial patience. A lesser race would have blasted us back to the Stone Age, or exterminated us before we could spread to the stars. Instead, they offered us membership in their confederation, called the Sentient Milieu. We again conquered the hunting beast within us, to become a star-faring race and cooperative members of the Milieu. Uh, tell me about the Tallow. The Tallow were a slow, serene, quiet race. Of all the species we have met, only the Tallow did not trigger our instinctive territoriality. They were the only people we could talk to without the hunter inside us screaming, kill the interloper, rip out its life. We believe that their rock-like, silicon-based biology was the vital factor that made the Tallow seem non-threatening to us. Whatever the reason, they cared about the Urquan and respected our potential when all other races saw only a brutal enemy to be destroyed. With their unconditional acceptance and devoted guidance, we grew into a proud and mighty race. They were the only species we ever called friend. And then, we met the Dinyari. Tell me about the sentient milieu. Nearly 25,000 Earth years ago, our home quadrant birthed the greatest confederation of starfaring races ever known. The sentient milieu existed to provide a safe haven for emerging sentient species. It governed itself with an enlightened respect for all species, much like your league of sentient races. The six founding races were the Tau, the Draw, the Faz, the Maelnu, the Yuli, and the Yuktar. It will they be on the test. found a place for the Urquan, who could not tolerate the presence of other sentient beings. The Tallow championed our membership and ameliorated the trouble we caused. Ameliorated? We became scouts and solitary explorers for the milieu. We proved our worth over and over again, defending the milieu from slavers and dictators. We are excellent fighters because we do not fear death. We know that if we do our duty, in our next life, we will be reborn as another Urquan. Our association with the Tallow and the Milieu lasted for 3,000 years. 3,000 of the brightest years in the painful and tormented history of the Urquan. 3,000 years until the day of the Dinyari. Uh, you said, wait, what? What test? I wasn't paying attention. Oh, he was just listing off some, uh, uh, species names from a, a, uh, the sentient milieu, which was a group that their species used to belong to. But, uh, none of those species come up again. This is just, you know, lore dumping. Tell me what happened then. On a routine planet fall, we discovered some anomalous energy readings, a sign of precursor installations. There, we met a race of bloated, evilly intelligent, toad-like creatures called the Dinyari. They possess ghastly psychic powers to control the minds of other sentient beings, and they wanted to rule the entire universe. They enslaved our minds and forced us to transport them to the milieu's capital world. The insidious war for dominance was quick and nearly bloodless. Within weeks, the Dinyari had psychically dominated six of the seven races in the sentient milieu, but they could not control the Talos. We suspect that the same unusual rock-like biology that made the Tallow seem non-threatening to the Urquan also gave the Tallow natural immunity to the Dinyari's psychic compulsion. But the Tallow had no immunity to the weapons of the Urquan. While the Tallow labored to create a device to free us, the Dinyari ordered us to open fire. 
on our dearest friends. Oh no! Nikalo refused to take up arms against us, and were slaughtered. To our eternal shame, we committed genocide, burning them from the face of the galaxy. Um, yeah. Does anybody feel like bringing these guys into the uh, league was kind of an Operation Paperclip situation? <laughs> Tell me more about these Dinyari. The Dinyari were evil, hateful, depraved creatures from a world they called Blilandi. We don't know how they got their mental powers, or why a race with such powerfully advanced minds was isolated on one planet. We know little about them save that they were the greatest menace the galaxy has ever known. What happened next? For thousands of years, we were unthinking slaves to the Dinyari, carrying out their every depraved command. Like the five other surviving races of the old milieu, we had no choice but to obey. The Dinyari's compulsion was too strong to resist. The Dinyari said the Urquan were their favored slaves because we were so easily compelled. But we prefer to think that we were simply the most mentally sensitive. We were forced to destroy those races which did not serve with the efficiency and speed demanded by the Dinyari. They decided that the Yuli and the Draw were inferior. They instructed us to incinerate their worlds. And we did. The once great sentient milieu degenerated into nothing more than a great galactic prison camp. But when the Dinyari sought to manipulate the Urquan genes, they brought about their own downfall. How did they manipulate the Urquan genes? The Dinyari were not content just to exploit our bodies and corrupt our minds. They blasphemously defiled the very soul of our race by toying with the priceless genetic codes that created us. Using ancient precursor technology, they ruptured the Urquan into two sub-races. They created the Green Urquan to be administrators and planners, and they made the Black Urquan to be warriors and builders. Our species would never be the same again. Then what happened? A brilliant Green Urquan researcher named Kazurza made the cataclysmic discovery that led to the violent overthrow of the Dinyari slave empire. Black and Green Urquan joined together and fought their oppressors. But galaxy-spanning empires do not fall easily. The war raged on for years, years of ceaseless agony. We allied with races like the Thags, an old ally from the sentient milieu. Finally, the Great Urquan Slave Revolt was won. But in our jubilation over our great victory, we sowed the seeds of a greater downfall. Uh, describe Kazurza's discovery. Kazurza had been commanded to study the severe mental trauma caused by long-term exposure to the Dinyari's psychic compulsion. Kazurza knew that when a slave died, the Dinyari who controlled the slave had to rapidly disconnect from the slave's mind, or the Dinyari would die as well. But Kazurza discovered that the Dinyari also temporarily disconnected when the slave experienced extreme, nearly lethal pain. Kazurza entered a state of excruciating pain, and in a moment of freedom, broadcast this secret to the entire universe. In all parts of the Dinyari slave empire, the Urquan gashed open their own bodies, burned themselves, hurled themselves into jagged heaps of scrap metal, Anything to purchase the few precious seconds of freedom necessary to grab the nearest Dinyari and crush the bleeding creature to jelly. That's hardcore. The primitive mortification of the body gave way to more sophisticated tactics. Alas, Kazurza did not survive to see the day that the Urquan perfected a ghoulish torture device called the Excruciator. They inserted the Excruciator directly into their own brains, where it unleashed an unending stream of agony which released them from the grip of the hated Dinyari. The gutless slavers squeamishly recoiled from the minds of the Urquan and were slaughtered. We butchered most of the Dinyari, but made the mistake of leaving some alive to serve as our translators. After all that, you left some Dinyari alive? Exterminating the Dinyari was not punishment enough to satisfy the Urquan, who had suffered enslavement, biogenetic degradation, and years of screaming pain. A slow death 
was too kind a fate for such monsters. The combined Urquan Starfleets decided to inflict a vicious form of poetic revenge upon the Dinyari. We genetically modified them. We gutted their minds, turning them into subsentient dumb animals. That way, they could never again dominate our minds, and we could stop using the excruciators. And then we further degraded these once omnipotent creatures by forcing them to serve as our translators. They became our talking pets. It just sounds like everyone's awful here. Uh, why did you need translators? Oops, there we go. After the horrors of the Dinyari slave empire, the Urquan had become more xenophobic than ever. We considered all other races so grossly inferior that merely speaking directly to another race was a revolting act. We used our talking pets to do that dirty job. Then what happened? We had won the Urquan slave revolt and were the preeminent power in the galaxy. After years of mind-wrenching agony, we refused to ever be enslaved again. Sounds reasonable. But our racial divisions were deep, and we could not cooperate on this goal. In our paranoia, we split into two subspecies factions and created two conflicting doctrines designed to ensure our freedom. We Green Urquan now called ourselves the Kazurza, in honor of the Urquan who triggered the revolt. The Black Urquan called themselves the Korra, in honor of the charismatic fleet officer who commanded them. Neither faction would embrace the doctrine of the other faction, and so we fought another long and bloody war, this time against each other. Describe those two doctrines. The Green Kazurza established the path of now and forever, a doctrine which required all other sentient species to serve as our slaves or have their planets forever imprisoned beneath impenetrable force shields. The Black Kora found this plan too complicated and marred by the same error that brought down the Dinyari, the mistake of allowing potential enemies to live. They created a simpler alternative. Their eternal doctrine called for the systematic eradication of all sentient life in the universe, all except the Urquan. Before we could stop them, they cleansed the home world of the Yuktar, destroying yet another milieu race. We protected the milieu race called the Faz beneath an impenetrable slave shield and stopped the Kora before they could destroy the planet of the last remaining free race, the Maelnum. We challenged them, and as we fought, the Maelnum slipped away. We were never able to find the Maelnum again, but it did not matter. We had matters of far greater import before us. The first great doctrinal war had begun. Whoever wins, we lose. <laughs> They're arguing about the best way to deal with other species. Kill them or enslave them? How about neither? Our doctrinal war raged for decades and ravaged worlds that had barely begun to recover from the horrors of the Dinyari slave empire. The two Urquan subspecies careened down the path to mutually assured destruction when the Green Kazurza discovered a precursor battleship. This massive vessel, which we called the Samatra, was infinitely more powerful than any ship ever seen before. It sliced through the Kora forces in just a few days and defeated them utterly. But we Kazurza were humble in victory and allowed our Kora relatives to live. Besides, we were no longer convinced that our doctrine was superior to theirs. We decided to put both doctrines to the test in opposite halves of the galaxy and determine which was superior. We exiled the tattered Kora fleet to travel in a direction that went against the spin of the galaxy, while we traveled in the other direction. When the Urquan would meet again, we would fight in ritual combat. The superior doctrine would prevail, and that faction would control the precursor battleship. If the eternal doctrine proved strong enough to let the Kora rebuild their shattered strength and actually defeat us, we would stand aside and let them kill every sentient being in the galaxy. Then what happened? Many millennia later, the two Urquan factions met in a large area centered near the Craterus constellation to fight the second and final doctrinal war. The Korra were armed with the resources of the many races they had exterminated. 
The Kazoza were aided by eight great races arranged in a rigid hierarchy, which we called the Hierarchy of Battle Thralls. Our war was going splendidly until you appeared on the scene. So they each went a different way across the galaxy and then met once they uh, got to the other side, which means that if the Korra made it all the way there, half the galaxy has been genocided by them. <laughs> Tell me about the hierarchy. The hierarchy consisted of nine starfaring races, including the Urquan. The Androsynth were genetically manipulated clones of your race, human. They mysteriously disappeared before the end of the Second Great Doctrinal War. The Ilrath are a race of peace-hating, highly religious, spider-like creatures who were fanatically devoted to their gods, Dogar and Kazan. They were one of the strongest of the battle thralls until you deceived them into attacking one of our other races, the arrogant, brutal Fradish, using a hyperwave caster you took from another of our races, the Umgar. The Umga are blobbish, multi-eyed creatures that relied on biomechanical hybridization for their technology. All these races have now been pacified by you and your allies. The Vux and the Mycon were also pacified, but agreed to give up conquest and join your expedition here to the Kasari Quadrant. The Spathi and Yihat left the hierarchy during the war to become your allies. They are also part of this expedition. Though the Yihat have since merged with the Pekunk, and are now part of the Pekunk race. So yeah, um, sounds like we just, uh, it's like, uh, in the later season of a TV show where th uh, the uh, villain is so popular that they're like, alright, we gotta, he's gotta join, it's like Spike, you know, uh, from Buffy. Spike was a villain, and then they're like, oh, everyone loves him so much, he's gotta, he's gotta join up with them. I guess that's what they're doing with the Urquan and the Vux and the Mycon. Describe what happened after the Second Doctrinal War began. We imprisoned many worlds to save them from the horrors of the Eternal Doctrine. One of these worlds was your planet, Earth. We did not know that a colony of Earthlings had left the planet and crash-landed on Unzervald, an undiscovered Precursor planet. Evidently, you were born there, grew up with Precursor artifacts for play toys, and found you had an affinity for the powerful devices. You were able to create a Precursor ship and use its power to unify many enslaved and shattered races into a formidable alliance. You were able to find the one remaining sentient Dinyari that still had its compulsion powers, as well as a hatred for the Urquan. And you found the mind shield that the Talo had built to save us from the Dinyari. You cleverly employed all these things to approach and blow up the Urquan Samatra battleship. Both the Kazurza and the Kora were crushed and neither doctrine prevailed. It was as if the Talo had reached across the eons to smite the Urquan, their genocidal protégés. Uh, it took a whole lot more work than simply finding a precursor vessel in a, a Dinyari and a Talo mine shield. That is true. The remaining Korra refused to surrender. They were taken into custody by your alliance and remanded to our care. The remaining Kazurza surrendered, realizing that neither doctrine was correct. All Urquan gave up our reliance on the Dinyari to translate for us, and now speak directly. You did not destroy either faction of Urquan, and representatives of Green Urquan came along on the expedition to demonstrate our new status as functioning members of the League. Even though there are Kora observers in our expedition, we brought none of their marauderships to the Kasari Quadrant. Daily contact with the Korra reminds us of the great punishment we must bear. What punishment is that? The unnatural genetic division of Green and Black Urquan remains to this day, causing no end of sorrow and distress for us. We feel palpable pain to look upon an opposing member of our divided species. Our race will never be whole again and there may be no hope for the two factions but to partition our species forever. That's harsh. Ready to get to work? Yes. Nothing further at this time. Carry on, Urquan Lord Zoroff. May your mission meet with the greatest success. That was a very long story. Let's grab some of your colonists. Come on. Nope. There we go. And scooch you up.
Where to next? ICOM online. A signal received from an emitter on Hypnos 2 confirms the presence of a Chimur colony. Chimur. ICOM offline. Uh, is it? That's the one. Hey, and it's green even. Now, I don't have a pod, so I'm not going to pick up that thing yet. Oh, and my ships are full, so let's just talk to the Chimur then. We greet you, human captain. Welcome to the Chumur homeworld in the Kasari Quadrant. We are gratified that you have survived the rigors of the warp bubble transport to the Kasari Quadrant. Uh, you and me both, I'd like an update on your status, Chumur. We have initiated colonization at high productivity levels. We have harness the abundant raw materials of this planet to produce avatars for our vital mission. Those powerful avatars will come in handy. I'll make sure to load up. You are intent on stopping the unnatural interdimensional fatigue and restoring the integrity of the fabric of space. We are prepared to assist you in whatever way we can. What do you need from us? Come for some of those avatars. We will provide you with as many avatars as you wish, along with enough Jamur to command as many vessels as you wish us to build. We remind you that our ability to create avatars is in direct proportion to the amount of planets and planetary resources that you provide to us. It's a great ship. I'll make sure you get a lot of resources. We accept your leadership. Tell me about your avatars. Avatar battleships are devastatingly effective fighting vessels. With competent tactics, these ships can defeat any ship in space. The avatar's main weapon is a laser of unparalleled power with living crystal to amplify the beam of coherent light. This primary weapon is supplemented by three orbiting zap stats. These smaller vessels automatically shoot enemy ships and missiles. This secondary weapon is in turn supplemented by a strong tractor beam that focuses artificial gravity on an enemy ship. The tractor beam can drag the enemy into the lethal orbital path of the zap stats. Uh, tell me about the precursors. The precursors were a mighty race that vanished for reasons we cannot comprehend. We suspect there is a link between the collapse of star systems and the disappearance of the precursors. We also suspect that the Murnmurm were a result of precursor machinations. Tell me about the history of the Chamur. The Chamur were once two separate races. The crystalline Chen Jesu and mechanical Murnmurm. The Chen Jesu were an old race of silicon-based life forms that evolved as photochemovores feeding on light and minerals. The Chen Jesu developed a philosophy of inclusion that led to the founding of the Alliance of Free Stars. The Mern Merm were not old, but they too were peaceful. They awakened only a scant thousand years ago, but they did not awaken into a peaceful time. What happened? In those days, the Urquan were not our allies. Their ill-conceived doctrines drove them to enslave or destroy all sentient life in the galaxy. The Chen Jesu and Murmurm formed the Alliance of Free Stars to resist the Urquan. We recruited many races, including humans, but soon the Alliance had all but lost so what did you do? I like how they have uh, different poses for different uh, uh, emotions. 
the Chenjesu and Murdmurm retreated from the struggle to undergo hybridization into one race. You assisted this process with the radiant energy of the sun device and sped up the process by decades. We emerged as the Chamur, not two races, but one voice and one body. This process allowed us to enhance your weapons and facilitate the cause of destroying the Urquan battleship, the Samatra. What happened then? The Chamur took responsibility for eliminating the remaining Urquan during the time your escape pod was missing. We freed sentient races from the crimson prisons of slave shields during the time you recovered from your war wounds. We have accepted the Urquan as allies in this mission, but we still watch them closely. Since you are the elected leader of this mission, we defer to your judgment in the Urquan matter. Uh, why don't you trust the Urquan? We do not mistake the Urquan surrender for submission. We have studied the Urquan for millennia. Once again, the Urquan struggle with themselves to define their future. Good, keep an eye on them for me. It shall be so. That guy took a while to spin on, let's see. Um, do you have any evidence that the Urquan might not be loyal? We have no hard evidence and the Urquan conversion appears sincere, but we know that they were a belligerent race even before they were forced to commit acts of genocide. We also know that they committed acts of genocide of their own volition after the mental compulsion was gone. If they remain devoted to the high-minded league ideals, it will be through Herculean acts of self-discipline. Ultimately, the Urquan doctrinal fervor is irrational, making predictions problematic. I have a question on a different topic. What do you need from us? Uh, that's it. Very good. Keep up the good work, Shmur. We await your return. Okay. Grab some of you. 20, come on. There we go. Everything in this game is sliders, but it's like dealing with discrete quantities. I wish it would give me like just a, a number option field or whatnot. Okay, where next? ICOM online. How about a hint? Removing the incomprehensible Daktak Lakpak drones from friendly territory will allow our colonists to gain a firm foothold in the Kasari Quadrant. Okay. ICOM offline. So he wants me to kill those Daktak Lakpak, but um, I don't have a pod to pick up that thing yet. So if I want to leave the Daktak Lakpak there so that I know he's so that I know there's something to dig up there. I'm also going to ditch the uh, human ships because they aren't very good and pick up the Chamur ships. I'm going to head back to Earth or the Earthling system because I bet they have developed pods more. The Precursors were apparently frustrated in their quest to reach their full Precursor potential because of galactic devastation wrought by a mysterious and even more ancient race. A race so dangerous that they must never actually learn its full name. They refer to this race as the Eternal Ones. We can't tell if this devastation happened in their past or if they're anticipating it in their future or some sort of ongoing devastation. It's very hard to translate this, 
we suspect that precursors have a different relation to time than we do. Excellent work. Whatever you say, sir. Hi, Captain. How can... Well, you know about the eternal ones. We only know what the tech teams have come across. Okay. Talk to you soon, Captain. Do you have pods yet? I can't believe I set that to... No. I need you guys to be building pods because I need... I need them. I'm just gonna sit here and... Oh, yeah. Let's set time to full. That should get them built better. Built quicker, rather. There we go. Now I should be getting some pods. Oh, what's going on? I offer you greetings, my shining one. We, Erelu, are so pleased to behold you again. You surpass our greatest expectations. We are very proud of how far you have come since we defeated the hierarchy of battle thralls together recently. Or so long ago, depending on your proximity to time. But it was a glorious victory and one that becomes you so. And now, behold, you have a new precursor vessel at your command. Our vested interests in your development have been richly rewarded. Uh, Transgirl J says, what the fuck is that? This is an Erelu Lalile. They are the little green men. They fly in little flying saucers. They have been visiting Earth forever. They are extra dimensional beings. And, uh... They showed up just now. Let's go. Uh, well, thanks, Erlu. Good to see you, too. We are well pleased, my bright and shining one. Your achievements glow, but your potential shines. Shining one, you're shining one. I think you've mistaken me for someone else. Have I offended you? How can I appease you? Do not be hurt. I am feeling only pride for you. Do you understand now? I have a lot of questions for you, my erstwhile ally. The human mind is so direct. Although such behavior might be viewed as impolite from a more mature race, a younger race like yours must be accorded a wide latitude. Your kind is so short-lived that in order to accomplish anything, you must get to the heart of the matter immediately, lest you die before you see the task completed. I think this is the same voice actor as the Mycons. He has a very similar cadence. Um... Where have you guys been since we defeated the hierarchy of battle thralls together? We are many places at many times. This place is an easy place, one of the ten easy places. At different times, we explore different easy places and places in between. That is our way. Oh, I can see from the look in your eyes that I have confused you again. I am silly. Please disregard my words. We wanted you guys along on this mission, but we couldn't find you. Forgive us if we forget the importance you attach to such events as this. Our context is infinitely broader than yours in scope, both in space and time. Nevertheless, to please you, I shall try to recall. Yes, now I remember. The Adderloo were where we always are. You simply didn't look in the right place. Or perhaps in the right time. Then you did not need us, so we did not come. Now you do need us, so we are here. You guys also disappeared during the Urquan War. Can we really rely on you? You judge us by standards far below our purpose. Understand that we have never taken our protective gaze from you. 
we routinely visit Unzervault, the world of your birth. And there, we watched you create a new precursor vessel. Our assistance is ever with you and the human race. Why do you routinely visit Unzervault? We Aralu visit many planets. How did you Aralu get here with hyperspace travel not working? Our ships move between our home and true space through weaknesses in the interdimensional fabric. We generate these portals artificially with focused dimensional fatigue rays. We gave you such a portal spawner for your battle against the Urquan hierarchy. We were so pleased to help guide our shining ward to victory. Though you clearly do not need such a thing now. Your warp bubble engines convey you through true space with ease. Uh, the brain skull moving is deeply disturbing. Yeah, I'm going to ask him about that in a second. My new precursor vessel doesn't need a portal spawner, but all my allies could use some. How many can you give us? No, no. You mustn't use such technology again. We gave you a portal spawner so that you could defeat the hierarchy. Our gift was necessary, despite the dangers. Without our gifts and guidance, the hierarchy would have been victorious, leading to greater catastrophes for your beautiful, unspoiled race. Now, events beyond your understanding dictate that we restrain you from further use of the device. You must trust us. Um, do you mean blind trust? How can I trust you when you don't let me know what's going on? We do not seek blind trust. Although the answers are so bright, they would blind your developing mind. No, we prefer childlike trust to blind trust. Oh, I don't like that at all. Humans are so like our children that we must be careful with our wisdom, lest we lead you astray. We have much hope for you, but you must understand your limits. Oh, that's some, uh, that's some paternalistic BS if ever I've heard it. That sounds like stuff I heard growing up in the church, man. What dangers are you talking about? You didn't tell me any of this before. You desire honesty, and that is what I offer. You ask for illumination, but I cannot offer that. Such illumination would be too bright for your mind. Understand that the portal spawner has served its purpose. The hierarchy was defeated. Your unspoiled people are safe. I still want to know what you know about interdimensional fatigue. You humans must learn patience. Always instinct, instinct, instinct. <laughs> we admire instinct, though we possess none ourselves. Were you taking credit for the defeat of the hierarchy? I think I did most of the work on that job. You are angered, embarrassed. We look upon your deeds with pride. What are you if not the embodiment of the best qualities of your race? We hope that you do not begrudge us our pride, knowing our efforts help to bring about your accomplishments. I have a question on another topic. Ask me what you will, my shining one. Um, what do you know about the problems with the fabric of space? Recent events have caused the universe to lose some of that stability, at least locally. More I cannot say at the present. Why don't your lips move when you speak? I do not speak, my child, but it is a natural mistake to make. But once the thought blossoms on the Erelu mind, it shakes loose many seas which carry on the solar winds. If they should float past a psyche that is fertile with sentience, they can take root and grow. You humans still express your thoughts through cumbersome vocal gyrations, but you are such a fresh and vigorous race that seeing the exertion of speech is becoming to you. Hearing your speech evokes rich memories, but your species shatters old limitations quickly, do you not? Deeper capacities are flowering in your species as reflected by humans with... What crude term do you apply to them? 
psi rating? Perhaps one day you will have children or grandchildren with these capacities. I'm just saying, um, this just comes across like the, I don't know, this, this feels like he's a groomer. Like, he's like, oh, ha ha ha, humans, you're so mature for your species age. <laughs> you know? Uh, tell us about your origins. Your curiosity is understandable, even heartening. But to explain the origins of the Erelu would require a common language for wonders such as time, that you have too limited a frame of reference to comprehend. Even your translation devices cannot convey them to you. Though it fills me with sadness to do such a thing, I must refuse your request. Perhaps one day your descendants will be ready to hear our story. I make you this promise. I will follow your line and explain our existence to the first child that is born with the capability of understanding. Uh, tell us about your history. We are not from your space or your time. We are from realms that you only understand in theory. We take little interest in true space, except when we discovered your race. We have known your kind from the very start. We call ourselves the Erelu Lalile, from the name given to us by an ancient Earth culture. Why did you take such an interest in humans? We are drawn to the great potential of your race. We have protected and guided and molded your race from the beginning. When human reached the stars and joined the alliance of free stars, we had to reveal ourselves for your safety. After the Erquan enclosed Earth in a slave shield, it was clear that your people would now be safe without us. We decided to return to our nook in time. But then, you appeared, a human child born on Unzervolt, commandeering a precursor vessel and challenging the full might of the Urqua. We knew that humans needed us again, and we returned, just as we return now. How, Rosie, you guys went AWOL from the Alliance before we beat the Urqua, and then we couldn't find you for the expedition here. Never doubt our motives, Captain. Your well-being is of paramount concern to every Arilu. We returned to assist you then, and with our guidance, the Urquan were beaten. With the threat passed, you did not need our direct intervention. We pursued other matters. After the collapse of hyperspace, we knew you would need our help again. And here we are. We can't reach your quasi-space homeworld from here. How do we contact you? When you need us, the Erelu will find you. I would appreciate some more specific information. You shall have it. The Supox are in danger, my child. You may find them in the realm beyond quasi-space portal M. I will now transmit those coordinates to your ship. If you're... Uh, hang on. If the Supox are in danger, maybe you should have gotten to the point a little earlier. Such matters as time are not so simple as they seem from your perspective. If you're so worried, why don't you come with me? We could use your ships. As much as we would like to accompany you to share in your accomplishments, this cannot be. We are otherwise engaged at present. The Erlu hope to influence events through you with our advice. More we cannot offer, but our words should suffice. What about the ores? We can't find them either. Are they in danger as well? You may find the answers at the quasi-space portal. The ores are more a danger than endangered. Ooh, that's ominous. The ores are dimensional travelers like you, isn't that right? The ores are dimensional travelers, but are not like the Erelu. They are a projection into this realm from elsewhere. All right, I'll check it out. I'm out of here. Goodbye. I wish you good fortune, Shining One. We shall meet again. Okay. Ooh, what do we got?
We've received another distress call from the Mycon. Oh boy. I want to get some uh, pods. Another thing? What do we got? Sir, coordinates for Quasi Space Portal M have been integrated into League charts. This phenomenon is located within the Nix system. Nope, I'll take a look. ICOM offline. But I need some uh, landing pods. Okay, I got my first one. I want to get three of them. Once I've got three, I will check with the Micon, and then I will go back to the Chimer system to deal with that one guy, and then I will go to Quasi Space Portal M. Okay, that's my second one. What do we got? The Precursors were so threatened by these Eternal Ones that they had to go away or go back or go under. We can't fully translate this gone word. It appears to refer to a technology we're not aware of, and maybe our minds can't yet conceive of it. Possibly go back in time. We're also having trouble with the tense of the verb. One way to read it is that they not only went away once, but that they will have to go away again or are continuously going away. They have definitely gone away more than once and seem resigned to going away sometime in the future. But they are continually in a state of being gone away, except when they're not. We apologize for the vagueness, but this is such a strange set of concepts that it has sidelined three of our best xenolinguists on temporary mental health needs. Oh no, <laughs> thanks for the help. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, I just realized I have artifacts to research as well. Hey, Sai, welcome. Let's get all these guys researched. Oop, what do we got? Another distress call from the Micon. Okay, I'll get there. I just want to get everything researched first. One more, come on. Okay. We've determined that the Micon were created by the Precursors to perform terraforming duties on a vast scale. The Micon were also charged with stabilizing planetary crusts during the galactic devastation that followed in the wake of these mysterious eternal ones. The Precursors wanted the Micon to last beyond the time the Precursors go away. So they genetically engineered the Micon race to be born adult and undergo no childhood development. The Micon could manipulate their own genetic material to accomplish specific tasks, but have no possibility for the kind of random mutations that can allow a race to develop on its own. If they could develop normally, they might die out, and the precursors needed them around too much for that. But ironically, that caused the Micon to be unable to fulfill their precursor potential. Well, thanks for the help. Whatever you say, sir. Okay, let's slow time down. Um, oh yeah, let's upgrade, oh, I need more resources. So what I need to do here, here, let's turn off all of that and then there we go. Now I'm getting some resources. I'm actually going to collect a bunch of resources. Let's let him fill up. All the way. Okay, uh, pause that. Let's get all these guys back up. And now, let's go to the Micon. Oh, actually, wait. That's right. More upgrades. Okay, my fleet has been upgraded. At least all of the ones that uh, my uh, artifacts uh, enabled. Okay, Mycon, what's up? The non-steel resources from the womb of the deep children 
The non must become void. The non who raid are the Vux. Gasp. The Vux? You're telling me they betrayed everyone? Um. It can't be. Uh, hyperspace travel doesn't work. The Vux are as stranded as you. Vux are non. Vux raid the deep children. Okay, I'll look into it. The non steal resources from the womb. Oh, you already said that. Um, if you say so, I'll check it out. Heat crests my pods. Um, what do you know about the Eternal Ones? Darkness is void. Juffelwop is light. Are you guys a precursor terraforming device? I am flu. I attend the birthing nodes. I died yesterday. I died in a bright flash. A convenient source lies beneath the crust. Uh, sounds, um... I, that kind of sounds like a confirmation that they are a precursor terraforming device. There are times you guys almost make sense. The Juffawup is strong in this place. All right. The deep children. Blah, blah, blah. Well, I'll confront the Vux. And I'll go to the Tremor. Hey, Vux. Greetings to the captain, who is our good friend. Oh, now you're friendly. The Micon report that you have been raiding them. Lies! Fallacious lies dreamed up by some barely sentient fungus. They say they saw you. It is a vicious lie! There is no proof of this! How could we travel to their world without hyperspace? That will do for now, but I'm keeping my eyes open. Don't remind me of your dual eye. It... Never mind. Uh, did you have other questions? Yes. Please, and... The Utwigs say that you are anti-League and out to betray us. Oh, really? And how do they know this? Their Ultron said so. Oh, their Ultron. Well, if their little religious toy says so, it must be true. Oh, my, the Ultron. Uh... Of course, you realize that was just sarcasm. Well, not mean sarcasm, more like irony. No, more like a light-hearted laugh with my good friend, the Captain. Uh, never mind all that. Are you anti-league? Captain, you wound me. Here we Bucks have overcome millennia of hating other races. Here we are, far from home. Here we are helping you. And what do you offer us in return? Accusations. Just answer the question. Captain, we love the League. I would prove it with a big, wet osculation. But you are too far away. We'll be watching you. Please and What do you know about the Eternal Ones? Who? What? Please. Okay. Later. Uh, let's get to the Tremor now. Take care of this guy. Dak Dak Lack Pack 5576 squared. Dak Dak Lack Pack 888 warning. Utilization to the 356th power divided by one. Right, right, right. Dak Dak Inversion. Let's blow you up. Oh yeah, in general, I shouldn't pull out the precursor ship for like other fights because if the precursor ship goes, well, that's the one I'm on. So uh, I would die. <laughs> Okay, I picked that up. Let's talk to the Chimur. Human Captain, the attacks made against the Mycon are a severe violation of League tenets. 
You must force these attacks to cease before they threaten League Solidarity. Um, okay, will do. I think probably what I'll do is after I go and check out the Supox, I'm going to hang out at the Micon base to see what happens with the attacks. What do you need from us? Uh, what do you know about the internal ones? We know as much as you know. Okay. We await. Let's see. Do you, you do not have a research station yet. Okay. Let's go to Quasi Space Portal M, actually. Before I do that, I want to let the day end because there's something that... Oh. Um, yeah, no, I'm going to go back to Earth. There, there's something that should be unlocking here. I just have to wait for it to Hi, trigger. How can talk so let me get my new artifact researched. Oh, the Micon got attacked again. Okay. It looks like it's uh, on every 10th day. Like, it was at 51, then 61. Oh, do we have... Oh, hey, I've got upgraded Micon ships. How about that? Okay. Ooh. Yeah, I shouldn't go there until I've got... Uh, Green. It looks like the gibberish spoken by the Dactek Lackpack drones is not gibberish at all. It looks like a language. Here we These go. This is what I was Dactek looking for. Dactek Lackpack may be sentient after all. We've found a rudimentary language key. We'll install it in your ship and you can test it the next time you talk to the Dactek Lackpack. Let's go! I appreciate all your efforts. Will do, sir. Now I just need to wait. 354, huh? So we'll get there soon. Oh. Unnatural interdimensional fatigue suddenly causes the Pika system to collapse into nothingness, leaving behind oh dear. a strange, dark anomaly. I'll have to take a look at that too. The Pika system appears to be gone. We need to go to the space it used to occupy to take readings. I'll take a look at that. Whatever you say, sir. Um, that would be the Pika system. Actually, hang on. Ooh, what up? We've discovered an item that resembles a 20-foot-tall flat spoon. The precursor records refer to this as the plasma regroover. We have no idea what it does, but the notations indicate that it's important to precursor terraforming. Maybe the Micon know what it is. Whatever you say, sir. Okay, I need to find more fuel. Oh, the Sirene have a bunch of fuel. Let's go, you. Hello again, human captain. We have a concern about the Mycon. In the wake of the attacks against them, they appear to be getting more and more erratic. They were never too stable to begin with, but now their behavior is a potential cause for concern. They could be a weak link in the League. Oh, uh, wait, wait, this is... These are all awful things to say. Oh, you're just mad because they destroyed your original homeworld during the battle days of the Irkwan Wars. Why would I say that to them? The Micon destroyed most of their race. That uh, All of these are awful things to say to somebody who's expressing concern about a species that literally genocided them. Let's go. I'll take that under advisement. Good. What do you know about the Eternal Ones? We have no direct knowledge of the Eternal Ones. But we occasionally catch psychic glimpses of a deep evil underlying the entire cosmos and occasionally rising up to decapitate all beings. Oh, uh, okay. Until next time. Do I have? Yes. Actually, let's set that to a more reasonable time. Okay, Daktak Lackpack. Let's talk to you. Warning. Intruder bearing sufficient reasoning power to qualify as a sentient organism. Detected occupying a portion of Kasari Quadrant space. Auxiliary warning. Organism of minimal sentience detected to be an unsanctioned possession of inviolable precursor technology. Directive. System unit is commanded to initiate alert status. Conclusion. 
eradicate minimally sentient organism before it breeds. Um, we're humans from Earth of the League of Sentient Races. We come in peace. How may we classify you, fellow sentient? Exclamation. Minimally sentient organism actually capable of mimicking genuine lexical intercourse. Conclusion. Dissect organism for study to determine source of realistic mimicry of authentic phraseology. Uh, it's not mimicry. My precursor translators allow me to actually talk your language. Vociferation. Minimally sentient organism displays capacities beyond mere mimicry. Minimally sentient organism displays characteristics of communicative cognizance. After all my talking, you finally figured out that I can talk. What a genius. Exclamation. Minimally sentient organism continues to exhibit characteristics of communicative cognizance. Conclusion. Investigate by testing organism with direct attempt at lexical intercourse. Query. Minimally sentient organism is directed to respond affirmatively if it can comprehend this statement. Affirmatively. Observation. Minimally sentient organism continues to display characteristics of communicative cognizance. Conclusion. Testing demonstrates subject's adequate comprehension. Query. Minimally sentient organism is directed to respond by stating its appellation. Appellation? You mean my name? Observation. Minimally sentient organism descends from a breed with peculiar naming conventions. Proclamation. Salutations, minimally sentient organism called Appellation, you mean my name. <laughs> no, we're humans from Earth of the League of Sentient Races. We come in peace. How may we classify you, fellow sentient? Proclamation. Salutations, minimally sentient organism classified as human from Earth. Reply. Self-appellation designed for utilization by lesser beings equals dak dak lak -pack. Uh, that's a mouthful. What self-appellation should I call you for short? Vehement assertion. Dak Dak Lak Pak is short form. Declaration 1. Dak Dak Lak Pak full appellation equals a highly complex plus elaborate phoneme cluster expressing the efficient plus elegant structure of the Dak Dak Lak Pak thought process multiplied by vigorous internal design organization. Declaration 2. Structural form of aforementioned phoneme cluster equals mathematical expression. Parenthetical discursion. Aforementioned mathematical expression defined as beyond the comprehension of humans' ponderous plus inefficient plus meat based mind. Conclusion Dak Dak Lak Pak have created a short form for use by all lesser life forms. Recapitulation Dak Dak Lak Pak is short form. Uh, phew, that's heavy, dude. We'll call you Dax for short. Ejaculation Alarm! Alarm! Linguistic violation in progress. Declaration 1. Humans short form equals offensive plus unacceptable divided by exasperation over inherent limitations of lower life form. I think we just found a slur. Declaration 2. Mitigating factor equals dak dak lak dak cognizant of defects in intellect found in lesser races. Parenthetical dispersion. Lesser races equals all currently discernible races minus dak dak lak dak. Conclusion. Dak Tak Lak Pak must condescend to endure one instance of offensive plus unacceptable short form. Ultimatum. Human is commanded to discontinue use of short form. Got it, got it, got it. Only a Dak Tak Lak Pak can call themselves the F slur. Uh. Okay, okay. Uh. Actually, <laughs> Dak Tak Lak Pak it is. I'll try to get used to saying it. Dak Tak Lak Pak. Dak Tak Lak Pak. Dak Tak Lak Pak. Assertion. The complex formula that comprises true and full name of Dak Dak Lak Pak equals complete instruction set for creation and maintenance of Dak Dak Lak Pak race. Conclusion. Dak Dak Lak Pak name greater than all others. So what? So your name equals big plus long and also equals your DNA. Big deal. Emphatic contradiction. Big deal as follows. Assertion 1. Eternal ones equal greatest of all races. Assertion 2. Full and true name of Eternal Ones equals complex formula that contains complete instruction set for creation and maintenance of Eternal One race. Assertion 3. Full and true name of Dak Dak Lak Pak equals complex formula that contains complete instruction set for creation and maintenance of Dak Dak Lak Pak race. Summation. Dak Dak Lak Pak name created in image of Eternal One name. Conclusion. Big deal equals essential importance of name. 
Dak Dak Lak Pak equals great in similar manner to Eternal Ones. Eternal Ones? You mean the Eternal One name is part of a formula? Clarification. Phrase Eternal One equals first letters in formulaic name that sums up Eternal One race of omnipotent beings. Assertion 1. Dak Dak Lak Pak name equals same essential construction as Eternal One name though to an infinitely smaller magnitude of complexity. Assertion 2. Dak Dak Lak Pak equal most advanced superior life form extant, except for eternal ones. Recapitulation. Dak Dak Lak Pak greater than all extant sentient life, minus eternal ones. Conclusion. Full eternal one name of vital importance to Dak Dak Lak Pak. All sentient creatures discovering the formula name are commanded to deliver it to Dak Dak Lak Pak immediately. Uh, Trans Girl Jade says, You're, I'm so confused. Basically, their full name is their DNA. And they're arguing that because the Eternal One's full name is also their DNA, that because they share that in common, they are superior to all other forms of life. Does that uh, clear it up for you? What do you know about the Eternal Ones? Assertion. Eternal Ones equals creators of all extant life. Explanation 1. Eternal Ones seeded the cosmos with genetic potential that arose into all lesser life forms. The precursors were the greatest of these life forms. Explanation 2. The return of the Eternal Ones to the galaxy signals the end of all sentient life. Explanation 3. Dak Dak Lak Pak equal the most sentient extant race. Conclusion. Return of the Eternal Ones must be postponed indefinitely. Well, hey, we're on the same team. We both want to stop the Eternal Ones. Contradiction. Dak Dak Lak Pak team not equal to human from Earth. Sure, fine. So what do you know about the Precursors? Assertion 1. Precursors are the second greatest race ever to inhabit the galaxy. Assertion 2. The living machines called Precursors created the living machines called the Dak Dak Lak Pak to serve Precursor interests during Precursor egress from the galaxy. Assertion 3. The Precursors created a powerful artifact called the Red Spiral Rail to seek out the greatest of all life forms. Assertion 4. The Red Spiral Rail equals in Dak Dak Lak Pak possession. Conclusion. All other Precursor material may not be conveyed to lesser races. Uh... Second greatest? Who is the greatest race? You? Contradiction. Eternal Ones equal greatest race. Assertion 1. Eternal Ones transcended physical reality. Therefore, Eternal Ones equal greatest race. Assertion 2. Precursors maximized their genetic potential. Therefore, Precursors equal second greatest race. Assertion 3. Dak Dak Lak Pak created by Precursors. Conclusion. Dak Dak Lak Pak equal third greatest race. Uh, why do you think the Precursors were living machines? We heard they were organic beings. Recapitulation. All other precursor material may not be conveyed to lesser races. Uh, we invite you to enjoy to join our League of Sentient Races. Directive. Invitation receiving consideration. Process. Computing. Conclusion. Invitation rejected. Directive. Transmission in. Uh, why are you rejecting our offer? Announcement. Formal declaration of current Dak Dak Lak Pak Association. Assertion 1. Current Dak Dak Lak Pak group identification equals hegemonic crux. Assertion 2. Affiliation congruent to exclusivity from all other coalitions. Conclusion. No other organizational affiliation possible. What is this hegemonic crux? Assertion 1. That information is restricted to members of the hegemonic crux. Assertion 2. Human from Earth is not a member of the hegemonic crux. Conclusion. Information restricted from human. Okay, that's fine. We'll just trade information then. Warning. Contradictory reply in progress. Assertion 1. Dak Dak Lak Pak information equals useful. Assertion 2. Human from Earth information equals ineffectual. Conclusion. Trade equals unacceptable. Um, if you we get info on the precursors or eternal ones for you, what will you give us? Statement. Deal equals non-operative. Assertion 1. All information on precursors plus all information on eternal ones 
equals property of the Dak Dak Lack Pack. <laughs> Assertion two. Withholding Dak Dak Lack Pack information forbidden. Conclusion. Human from Earth will be accorded permission to meet Dak Dak Lack Pack to yield the aforementioned information. Um, how generous. Anything else we can do for you? Assertion one. Humans from Earth may elect to extinguish the metabolic processes of all League members. Bitch, the fuck two. you say? Humans from Earth may then convert all League members' cellular material to dihydrogen oxide and other molecular components for dac dac lac pack factories. You... you want us to die? Observation. Human from Earth intellectual analysis finally has reached an accuracy factor equal to 100%. Why do you want us to die? Self-evident answer. Efficiency. Assertion 1. Current usage of molecular material by humans from Earth equals inefficient waste. Assertion 2. dac tac lac pack recycling of molecules currently hoarded by humans from Earth equals highly efficient usage. Conclusion. Efficiency demands the aforementioned consumption. How can we deliver precursor secrets to you if you recycle our molecules? Vociferation. Immediate answer, not instantaneously available. Directive. Dak Dak Lack Pack must ascertain answer immediately. Process. Computing. Any day now, Sparky. Assertion. Human from Earth currently in state of potential future possession of essential precursor information. Assertion 2. Precursor information more valuable than all other uses for molecules currently hoarded by organism comprising human from Earth. Conclusion 1. Human from Earth must be sanctioned to continue inefficient existence. <laughs> Conclusion 2. Human from Earth and League of Minimally Sentient Races must be sanctioned to occupy a portion of Kasari Quadrant space. Uh, really? Gosh, thanks. Query. Does the human from Earth have new precursor or eternal one information to transmit? Uh, not any more than I had when this conversation started. Observation. No new data. Directive. Transmission terminated. Oh, hey, that's the end of that. Oh man, I've got a bunch of pods now. Okay, let's go and hit this quasi space portal. Oh boy, these guys are great. Message from translation computer. Incoming transmission from the ores. Little progress has been made in furthering the capability of this computer to translate the ores language. He's because a gay of fish. the unorthodox composition of the ores language, this translation includes many lingual best fits. For clarity, these best fits are denoted by asterisk pairs. Overall accuracy of translation? Unknown. Translation begins. Hello, hello. We are happy to squirt sometimes. This is a fun time. You found ores in our slippery planks. Certainly you are silly cows. Now we must spit. Are you spitting? What? You spit slowly, so I will spit slower. I say for extra fun, you must play the game. Oars play and quick babies play. You know the quick babies. They are always jumping in front. No fun. No, I will not spit. Thank you all the same. Silly cow. You are more funny than several. You can't smell the pretty colors. So you must spit. You make me want to expand. But I should not. It is too lovely. What are you oars doing here? Other places too much hurt. So ours slipped here. Here it is smooth and bright. And no one hurt. But now this is not our house. Ours will go back to sad town. Later we will have parties. So the sad lonely bubbles will make more special sauce. Be happy. It is best. Uh, where are the Supox? Where are Supox? Supox are not here. Ours are here. Where should Supox play? Above or below? We smelled the Supox again in the slippery place, but they are too sticky. It was crumple. They tried to play, but they could not find the campground. It is crumple. So what happened to the Supox? Not enough juice. Supox are extra sick. Ours danced at the party. More juice, but not enough special salt. Too much sadness for all. There was no fun. Now Supox are crumple. No more smiley time. Do you agree? Uh, 
Are you saying that you tried to rescue the soup hawks? We smelled the soup hawks. They were sick. So they made the special sauce. It is too sad. Are you saying that you killed the soup hawks? The joke is sorry. You are silly. That is too much fun again. Uh, never mind, I'm not getting anywhere. Of course. Campers only can get into heavy space once you are connected. Oars can pulling campers inside for a party. Pulling campers inside for a party and all of those words were like best linguistic best fits. I I love these guys so much. Uh, like the Aralu, they are extra dimensional beings. And I think in another game they, they described that these are just kind of like uh, a projection of their extra dimensional self. It's like a, a finger of theirs sticking out into our dimension, but what they actually are is something beyond our comprehension. So here they're just funny little fish people. Our warp bubble trans or warp bubble dropped us in true space. How did you get here? We slid from outside to inside. You are lonely bubble. You cannot slide like oars, but you can be connected. All campers can be connected. This is soon, but you are even more silly cows and almost even slippery. You are so many lonely, juicy bubbles. I can take you to your colony planet. Will you join my battle group? We are too happy. You invite oars to your house. We can be special together. So much enjoyment. But first, we are squeezing the juice. Oh, I bet you're squeezing the juice. come to your house. We are connecting. Happy campers are good for fun parties. Okay, then see you later. That is funny. You think you see oars, but oars are not light reflections. Maybe you think oars are many bubbles too. It is such a joke. Oars are not many bubbles. I think many bubbles campers. are cells. Oars are just oars. I am oars. I am one with many fingers. My fingers reach through into heavy space and you see oars, but it is really fingers. Maybe you do not even smell. That is sad. Smelling pretty colors is the best game. Okay. Um, oh, I guess I'm inside the quasi space portal because I can't go out but let's go back in and there is a base now um oh there's also an anomaly so let's go to do that one first sir a routine sweep of debris in the local area has uncovered what appears to be the remnants of a spaceship uh great let's check it out icom offline hey dark tech lock pack what do you got for me a vowel human from earth must be destroyed directive System unit is directed to initiate combat mode. Whoa! We were had a friendly conversation last time. All right, here we go. Guess we're taking that. What did I pick up? Oop. Sir, we've received another distress call from the Micon. Okay, I, I need to get back to the Micon. I also need to take a look at that star that exploded. What is this? Oh, this object could be called an Ebon Hinge escapes you, so I can't even... That's not a regular artifact. It's a special artifact. Okay, let's go talk to the oars. Hello to our house. Do you feel better yet? You are campers, and you will enjoy the change. But maybe not yet. Let's spitting the fun words for several pieces and then surprising things. I'm glad to see that you have finally set up your colony. We like to be together. Do you want to be together with us? Always the other sad animals go away. But first, we have lots of fun. Too many fun is not enough. Do you agree? I think you smell like you do. Um, I'm glad we all get along so well. Remember when we kicked the hierarchy's butt together? Those were good times. We came together to dance very many. We gave you our heavy space ships with the go, go, so you could dance with the silly cow. And the go, go was going fastest to enter the ships of the other. It was too much happy time. We played with you at the Ta'alo playground. Are you remembering best? The aloe spread to the pretty place because Dinyari were chasing them. Then Dinyari was sleeping, so oars can chase them. Then we had a party. They were even better campers than you. 
Do not feeling bad. You are good enough campers, but not yet. I've come for some of your Oars Nemesis ships. Do you know? Oars can dance very well. Since you are a happy camper, and the dancing is fighting. Space ship for dancing. Oars will give. Yeah, okay, so dancing is fighting. There, some of these words, like, I, I think you can work out what they mean. Um, tell us about your history. Here is good news. Six or nine pieces ago, myself, the oars did not even smell your level. Can you believe? It is so silly. It is such a happy town. Then the Andersons made some slippery places. And then the oars can smell it. It smells so good, oars are surprised. I myself pushed the fingers into the new town, and there are so many campers. We must dance with the Anderson. Then we oh, can Oh, they fought the Anderson. The Arilu. Again, they are jumping in front. It is always... Mm. There is juice squeezing. And then we are not so... Crumble. Finally, we find you, the... Happy campers. And the Ta'alo... Playground. For sliding through. Where are the Ta'alo? There they are. It is too much fun. Then there is no more hierarchy. We are too happy in this slow time, heavy space. It is a better level for games. Then is the stuck in the slippery places and the coming to here. This is the everything story. Now you know. Tell me about the oars nemesis. Or ship heavy. Go, go. Do you know? These are best for letting go near heavy space planet body. Then go, go. Can going fastest to enter ships of the other. Then it is happy time. <laughs> um, what do you know about the precursors? Extra silly cows. Biggest party time would be happy days with extra silly cows. But ours can't smelling them. Where are extra silly cows? It is never. Uh, can you tell me anything about the eternal ones? Mm. You are crumple. You are silly. Is Ooh. this happy? No, I cannot spit these words with campers. Campers will change together and then what? All will be aware. If you are campers, you will enjoy the change. No more sad, lonely bubbles after party time. He did not like me asking that. Do you know anything about the rainbow worlds? Heavy space. Planet bodies with many colors. From the extra silly cow. Sometimes old toys are there, but never always. So the extra silly cows are the precursors. Uh, what do you think of the other races in the league? Campers are campers. But there is hiding silly cow out of many bubbles. It is not okay. Quick babies are too much trouble. And Cyrene are bad and silly cow. It is the case. Uh, quick babies, I think, are the uh, Aralu. Yes, you are anticipating about the Aralu quick babies. They are from outside. It is the same as oars, but not. Oars are from below. Aralu are from above. Oars does not like Aralu. Aralu are too much trouble. We cannot have parties when Aralu always jumping in front. It makes oars rumble so much. These are fat words. Okay, so uh, the Aralu and the oars are both extra dimensional, but the Aralu come from a different dimension than the oars do, I guess. Uh, tell me about the Sirene. It is too much about the silly cow. Cyrene are using their nasty tricks to smell all secrets every day. Not only campers, but oars. It is so crumpled. We are not happy. It is soon they are using the tricks to dominion the alliance. And then what? No more campers. So bad. It is better to not ignore or else there is so much problem. So what are the Cyrene doing? I am already explaining. <laughs> okay, I don't know what you're saying. I guess I'll ask the Cyrene about it. It's enough about the other races. I am telling the Alliance story. It is too much. You are learning about the Cyrene. You are, but then what? After this, you are so happy you are not spitting the many questions to not campers. It is not good for silly cows who use the nasty tricks to grab the secrets. It is sad town. I think that's about it. Thanks for your time. This is too joke. Time is not from ours to you, I am sure. We are all in the now space. It is happy spices. Why are you there? Of course, because also the ores are in the now space. It is a pleasure. Um. Oh, maybe you can tell me about this Evan Hinge thing. I am expanding. 
Oars must grab the old toy. Never for campers. But for oars, I am sure. All happy campers must come together for party time with friends. Old toy is for friends. Uh, no, I'm keeping it. You can tell your friends to find their own hinge. Mm. Happy campers should not jump in front. There must be juice squeezing. And then we are not so frumple. Campers must be giving the old toy to oars for other reasons. You are not even aware. So much pleasure is coming. You will realize. Reconsider is best. You are not forget. Oars can wait. Dancing is later, I am thinking. Is he threatening to fight me over this? Um, let's see. This is on. I have some questions you for you. You are asking us about the many. I am giving you good news. We talk again about the many pieces and special things. Okay, no, that's not. This is too ju- I uh, must be going. Thanks to you for the information. Goodbye. Yes, we do. Goodbye is the game. Hello, I am only joke. It is funny enough. Do not forget to enjoy the sauce. Enjoy the sauce indeed. All right, let's get you all pumped up. Um, how many you got 40? So I'm going to actually what I'm going to do. I'm not going to be taking their fleet with me. So instead, I'm going to dump all of the crew of their fleet. Send it there. Well, send almost all of it there. Let's get 22. Oh, you know what? I just realized. Um, if that's 16, so that's 15. Okay, so that's six. Then dump everything there. And then boom, 20 exactly. Okay. What's next? I come online. Perhaps you should ask the Cyrene if the ore's accusations leveled at them are true. Okay. Studying the spatial anomaly left by the collapse of the Pika system could aid us in understanding the phenomenon that occurred there. League scientists are eager to investigate. Perhaps you should ask... Okay, that's it. Icon I also need to take a look at the Mycon. Um, well, the Mycon are the only guys uh, who do not have fuel in range, but... um. Spathy look like they've got a lot of fuel, so let's go pick up some fuel from the Spathy. Hello again, friend Hunam. We make merry in celebration of your arrival. How go your foolishly courageous and noble efforts to save the galaxy? I'm sure you're doing very well, and can spare some time from dealing death and devastation to any offending races for long enough to have a nice visit. Please stay as long as you wish, and keep your massively intimidating ship in our orbit fending off all enemies with its mere presence. And while you are here, you can give your dear friend, the Spathy, many more worlds to colonize so we can make more ships and become even safer. Uh, what do you know about the Eternal Ones? We don't know anything specific. Unless... No. Never mind. What? What? Well... Since you asked, Spathy legends tell of an ultimate evil that will one day come and devour the universe. As yet, the ultimate evil remains largely unmanifest, and its powers and exact intentions are still a bit obscure, since it lurks just outside the range of even the most sensitive long-range detectors, which we feel gives conclusive evidence as to the ultimate evil's nefarious intent. We once heard a broadcast saying that the Grand Master Planet Eaters were coming to kill us, and we thought that we were actually about to be eaten by the ultimate evil. But it just turned out to be an umga prank. Too bad that we accidentally destroyed many of our rustic towns in the ensuing mad panic. Okay. Must you take your sheltering, protect- Um... Yeah, got, what do we got? Captain, the debris is from a Supox ship. Oh, no. There are numerous entry holes burned into the hull fragments. It's clear that the Supox ship was utterly destroyed. We see no trace of survivors or even Supox seeds. 
Excellent work. Whatever you say, sir. Well, that sucks. Um, oh, do we have nope, nothing more to upgrade. Well, then. Oh, actually, I probably have something to research, right? Yes, let's get you researched. Actually turning down the landing pad factory. I've got 20. I think that's probably enough. Also turning down the star base and the factory. I want the research done. There we go. Okay, now you guys can go and do your thing. Uh, oh, Chimur upgrade. Chimur are good ships. So, uh, right. Um, let's go to the Micon first. I'm gonna hang out here for the next attack, and then I will go check out the uh, exploded star. The raiders return. More harm. I'm getting tired of this. They must cease existence. Your dedication is appropriate. If you could encase yourself in the glowing earth without melting, you would know Jufflewop. Okay. Keep up the good work, Mike. On by. We cease to speak. No, let's turn that up. Game speed full. Let's get the uh, next invasion. Okay, here it comes. Greetings from it the is them. Box. The last word in life form destruction. To gain an intimate knowledge of our engines of war, simply place both hands over your eyes and count to three. Vux, you are commanded to stop. Stop? Stop? We haven't even started yet, you squishy, tuskless, smooth skin. Okay. So I want to use the uh, Utwig ship because the Utwig ship has a shield that absorbs um, enemy fire because the Bucks are going to warp in right next to me and fire on me right away. So. And then let's get up to full speed so that when the Bucks warp in, they don't actually get close enough to me. And full speed again. I uh, kind of fucked that one up, but that's okay. Let's... Okay, you're blown up now. And now that I know that it's the Vux, you got some splaining to do. I lost a ship from your attack. Greetings to the captain, who is our good friend. We have discovered that you Vux have been raiding the Micon. Why? I know nothing about this. It must be an illusion. A what? Elder space gods making illusions to tear apart the League. You should be careful not to be so gullible. The Vux ships I fought were no illusion. Then it must be Vux Renegades! You know, a few rotten zag fruit can spoil the whole goulash. How could these renegades to travel between worlds with the... That's a typo. How could these renegades travel between worlds with hyperspace gone? I do not know. I'll look into it. You do that. 
Have you any other questions? No, goodbye. Yeah, of course he's going to deny the whole thing. Uh, let's go to the Siren. Let's confront them on the Aura's accusations. Hello, Captain. We have a concern about the unexpected arrival of the Aralu. Do you trust them? Uh, definitely. About as far as I can drop kick them. There we go. We are concerned about their loyalty. In the days of the old alliance, they disappeared as soon as the Earth was slave shielded. They left the allies, including us, with nowhere to go and smack in the path of the oncoming Urquan Armada. Then, after the collapse of hyperspace, when we needed their insight and their working ships, they once again bugged out on us. Here they are again, and we have no reason to believe that they will be any more dependable now. Uh, I share your concerns. Are you suspicious of their ability to fly between stars when other races can't? Do you know something I don't? You should know that old Alliance records show that the mysterious malnutritional fatigue beings. Their form of space travel seems to be based on punching interdimensional fatigue holes in space. It is troubling to us, and we do not fully trust them. Uh, oh, hang on, I've got... Just a minute. Let me check stream health. No drop frames, I don't know. And was saying chat's disconnected, please wait while we try to reconnect you. Okay. I don't know what was going on there. I had something hiccup on my end, but uh haven't uh doesn't seem like I've lost any uh frames or anything like that, so uh here we go. Um no one is more troubled by the Aralu than me. What can we do for you? Uh, the Ors have accused you of trying to mind control the League. Well, the Ors are dead wrong. Um, how do I know I can believe you? You can believe us because we are completely loyal. Uh, I thought as much. Sorry to trouble you. <laughs> they don't have anything. They're just. What can we do for you? Uh, very good. Keep up the good work, Cyrene. Until next time, Captain. Uh, let's see. I actually want to turn off... Yeah, I've got enough uh, pods here to get everything else, so I'm going to turn off the landing pad factory on every uh, thing that I visit. Nope, nothing more here. Um, and it is 10.12 over here, so I think I'm probably going to call the stream here. Let me go ahead and let's save, yeah, let's save this one. Stream... And 9, 18, 23. Okay. And then we'll go ahead and exit. All right. So uh, thank you all so much for joining me for this stream. And uh, I will catch you on Thursday. Have a wonderful evening and uh, catch, uh, catch some Z's for me. <laughs>